Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to all of you. Uh, yang berusaha Mr. Mak Ali Rani, Deputy Chairman of Itma Osha, our invited speaker Dr. Muhammad Ibrahim, all new Itma student ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Laboratory Safety Talk and Card Activation Day. 2018. Okay, to start our program, we would like to invite Mr. Muhammad Kadri Masawan for the Doa recitation. Please welcome. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ya Allah, engkau berkatilah Majlis kami pada hari ini iaitu Laboratory Safety Talk and Card Activation Day Sebagai aktiviti yang bermanfaat dan mendapat perkenanmu Allahumma ya mujib Anugerahkanlah kepada kami keazaman Kekuatan dan ketekunan yang berterusan untuk merealisasikan hasrat UPM sebagai universiti bertaraf dunia melalui usaha secara kolektif, berinisiatif, inovatif, proaktif, berdaya saing dan kerja berpasukan serta mendepani pelbagai cabaran bagi menjulang nama UPM di persada pendidikan tertinggi. Allahumma ya mujibad da'awat wa qadiyal hajat Anugerahkanlah kepada kami keazaman, kekuatan dan ketekunan yang berterusan Serta keupayaan untuk mencapai pendidikan, penyelidikan dan pembangunan yang bermutu Dalam pelbagai bidang dalam universiti ini Jadikanlah majlis ini sebagai satu wadah untuk meningkatkan kekuatan dan memperbaiki kelemahan-kelemahan Dalam hal tujuh kami menjadi universiti yang mendapat pengintirafan dunia Allahumma ya muhi Allahumma ya muhaimin ya aziz aziz ya jabbar ya mutakabbir permudahkanlah urusan kami untuk menyediakan persekitaran kerja yang selamat kondusif dan sihat untuk semua warga kerja dan pelanggan-pelanggan kami serta persekitaran belajar mahasiswa kami anugerahkan kepada kami hidayah dan kesenangan kesenangan menyelenggara tempat bekerja dan sistem kerja yang selamat dan sihat Anugerahkanlah kepada kami Semua kaki tangan Pendedahan dan pemahaman Tentang maklumat, arahan Latihan dan penyedi- penyeliaan Berkenaan Cara untuk menjalankan tugas dengan selamat Dan tanpa risiko kepada Kesihatan, elakkanlah kami Daripada kemalangan, penyakit Keracunan dan kejadian berbahaya Permudahkanlah urusan kami Dalam penyediaan kemudahan-kemudahan Kebajikan bagi semua warga Kerja kami, anugerahkanlah Petunjukmu dan kekuatan Kepada kami untuk menghapuskan Gejala rasuah, penyelewengan Dan salah guna kuasa Secara berkesan, meningkatkan Kecakapan dalam sistem penyampaian Perkhidmatan awan dan Mengatasi karenah birokrasi Meningkatkan takbir urus korporat Dan etika perniagaan Memantakkan institusi keluarga Meningkatkan kualiti hidup dan kesejahteraan masyarakat Allahumma ya muhaiminu ya hafiz Sesungguhnya kami sedar bahawa Kekuatan rohani, spiritual, jati diri, patriotisme dan kesucian akidah tauhid Serta nilai-nilai Islam Membentuk nilai integriti sejati Justeru teguhkan dan tetapkanlah jiwa dan hati kami kepada Al-Quran dan Al-Sunnah yang sesuai dipraktik, yang dipraktikkan pada sebilangan masa, sebarang tempat dan zaman. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanah wa kina azab an-nar wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in subhana rabbika rabbi anzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursali wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Amin, amin, ya rabbal alamin. Thank you to Mr. Muhammad Kadri Masaud for the uh, recitation. Without further delay, we would like to invite our our first speaker for today, Mr. Muhammad Ali Marani, to introduce about introduction to Itma Osh Committee. Please welcome.
So this one slide actually uh, recycle from what really of the picture. Uh, uh, safety talk juga untuk pelajar baru. Uh, cuma this this time for this intake uh, itu buat awal. Uh, sebab I think this one is quite dah lambat lah. Uh, actually this one for ada second intake kan? Second intake. Uh, kita nak ke uh, for this uh, semester our uh, chairman for osh committee said that we have to buat awal lah supaya uh, tak terlalu lama okey uh, ada 12 berapa berapa orang 14 orang tiga dua uh, one from Iran I think if uh, dia datang saya kena cak cakap bahasa Inggeris penuh je lah uh, no man, sebab kita ada masa lama juga ni setengah jam so boleh reduce very short daripada mana uh, daripada lab mana dan juga Siapa supervisor? Okay, can we start from uh, depan? Okay. Bukan tak? Eh? Ada yang sah? Okay, Bismillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nama saya Nur Syahira binti Rosdi. Uh, saya master student under Dr. Abang. Uh, okay, setuju apa lagi? Saya uh, di uh, MSCL, lab MSCL. Bisa. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nama Syazana binti Sulaiman. Uh, supervisor Dr. Rabaa, Lab MSCL. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Nama saya Siti Arisha binti Muhammad Ghazali. Uh, saya student doktor student Prof Azhar. Mm, lab dekat Fakulti Sain BSL. Hai, nama saya Nur Ain Fatihah binti Azlan, uh, student master Prof Zupi, uh, lab MSCL. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, nama saya Nur Ain Ashkin, uh, student master bawah Dr. Yap Win Feng, uh, lab optik Fakulti Sains. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Uh, nama saya Muhammad Dina Aizat bin Rashidi. Uh, bawah Dr. Yap. Uh, dekat Fakulti Sain. Op Lab Optik. Selamat pagi. Saya Chu. Uh, supervisor saya Dr. Muhammad Amran, Muhammad Saleh. Uh, Lab saya kat Nuclear Malaysia. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi. Saya Muhammad Rizwan B. Amri, student master uh, under Dr. Faizah, lab uh, MPBL. Assalamualaikum, nama saya Khadijah Ahmad Jais, student PhD Dr. Suraya, lab MPTL. Uh, good morning, my name is Lewina, supervisor Dr. Halim, lab, lab MSCL tapi saya buat dekat Faculty Science 2. Okay, Assalamualaikum dan selamat pagi. Nama saya Siti Aisyah Harun. Uh, saya student PhD under Prof. Dr. Khamiru Amin. For synthesis, saya akan buat lab di UKM. Characterize by the ITMA atau Faculty Science. Staff yang UMP. Okay, last. Uh, nama saya Muhammad Faizal. Uh, PhD student. Uh, supervisor Dr. Janet. Lab uh, di MSCL dan Faculty Science 2. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you.
So kita ada beberapa orang PhD dan beberapa orang daripada master science lah. Uh, ada seorang saya perasan macam pernah nampak punya dia guna coating. So uh, Okay, bagi pihak ITMA, bagi pihak komiti, saya mengalu-alukan. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome all of you to ITMA. Uh, hopefully, you can happy lah duduk sepanjang uh, di, di ITMA ni. Uh, walaupun lab di, di Fakulti Sains, uh, awak boleh entitled. Actually, ada 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 working session tu kat sini lah. Tapi saya rasa perazah dia banyak kat sana lah. Okay, this is uh, my presentation outline. Ada tiga. Uh, saya tentu sikit-sikit bagian satu dan dua dan yang penting tu tiga, nombor tiga. Okay, let's go to Occupational Safety and Health uh, Act 96. So, Actually, kita dulu kita ada uh, semasa transition daripada community uh, based economy to industrial based in, uh, economy uh, statistik peningkatan accident di di tempat kerja makin meningkat. So uh, Jadi perlunya uh, Malaysia ni uh, membuat satu lagi akta uh, untuk penambahbaikan. That's why pada tahun 1994 kita ada akta baru, OSH uh, 1994. Uh, okay. Okay. This is philosophy of uh, OSHA. Responsibilities to ensure safety and health at the workplace lies uh, with those who create the risk and the, those who work with the risk. Okay, siapa yang create the risk, siapa yang work uh, with the risk. So, this one, create the risk is owner, uh, employers, suppliers, manufacturer, dan juga designers lah. Dan uh, orang yang menyediakan pematan lah. Orang yang bekerja adalah worker, uh, employer, uh, Uh, employees dan juga kalau bagi bidang kita sebagai pelajar pelajar adalah orang yang bekerja yang akan menghadapi ris uh, okay tu dari segi uh, term of pemberi pematan dan juga yang menerima pematan lah actually kita orang pun uh, bekerja di bawah uh, ris juga lah okay this one employer employer employee Uh, dia punya interpretation uh, immediate employer person who has undertaken the execution at the place uh, of work where the principal employer is carrying out his trade of business okay so for employee a person who is employed for wages under <coughs> a contract of service uh, in industries to which this act applies and direct Directly employed, uh, employed by principal employer, employed by immediate employer, and whose whose services uh, temporarily lend to the principal employer. Okay, this one objective. Ada saya rasa ada tujuh kot uh, objektif uh, uh, untuk untuk uh, akta ini. Pertama untuk promote uh, the occupational environment adaptable to the person. Uh, physically, uh, phys physiology and physiological needs. Yang kedua, to provide the means to work the legislative system based on regulation and industry code of practice. Uh, du dua kot. Dua. Uh, dua. Okay. This one, scope of uh, application. Kalau kita tengok kat sini, ada satu uh, scope yang tak termasuk dalam 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 OSH ni dia ada uh, ini yang termasuk dalam akta OSH 1994 OSH 19, uh, 1994 this one 
tak termasuk dia ada tak sendiri dia ada tak tak uh, lain lah dan juga mana de, dari dari segi bidang kapalan dia juga arm forces eh. ada dua so uh, kenapa uh, perlunya UPM uh, develop uh, jahatan kuasa kalau kita di peringkat UPM kita ada uh, OSH peringkat UPM uh, OSH uh, Komite uh, Jawatan Kuasa Keselamatan Pekerjaan Peringkat UPM dia punya pejabat di depan introp di belakang library fakulti uh, fakulti pertanian, pertanian lama siapa yang sempat dengan fakulti pertanian lama uh, dekat belakang library dia ada dia ambil satu bangunan untuk untuk ni lah so kalau UPM tak ada komiti ni, dia akan kena penalti. Penalti RM5,000 dan juga denda, uh, 6, 6 tahun penjara. Siapa yang kena? VC lah. Sebab dia ketua sebagai, kalau orang kata, kalau syarikat ni dia panggil CEO lah. So, VC yang akan kena benda ni. So, VC akan pastikan semua peringkat, peringkat uh, jabatan atau PPTJ Uh, kena ada benda ni uh, setiap PTJ uh, kalau sini dipanggil PTJ lah pusat tanggungjawab akan create satu satu jatah kuasa sendiri ok yang ni yang yang pentingnya lah uh, function dia ada tujuh ah, lapan lapan function of the committee for each uh, agensi uh, PTJ lah. Uh, pertamanya assist uh, in development of rule and safe systems of work. Uh, second, assist in uh, development and review the effectiveness of program. Tiga, carry out studies and analysis of incident trends and statistics. Yang empatnya report unsafe condition and unsafe practices uh, and make recommendation of for improvement. So kalau ada sesuatu yang rasa tak tak rasa tak selesa ataupun me, boleh boleh me, menyumbang kepada hazard ataupun kemalangan boleh boleh report pada jatuh kuasa lah. So nombor 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 lima review and recommend amendments to safety and health policy. Ini uh, peringkat uh, peringkat PTG mungkin taklah dia kalau ada pun kita akan beritahu peringkat UPM eh, peringkat UPM nya inspect the workplace at least once in 3 months and recommended recommend uh, preventive and corrective uh, measure ni kita ada buat memang ada uh, peringkat itu mah dia ada dia ada uh, check 3 bulan sekali uh, so nombor 7 discuss report for uh, report from SHO or safety health officer or uh, occupational safety and health officer uh, nombor 8 assist to organize promotional activity so this today activity dia dia termasuk dalam dalam nilah uh, yang nombor 8 ni okey uh, membership of the committee peringkat PTJ peringkat PTJ kita ada seorang chairman seorang at least kena ada at least seorang chairman seorang secretary so dua yang tu yang penting dan uh, management representative dan juga workers uh, representative so for itma we divide by two uh, di pejabat am um, uh, kebanyakan uh, pengurusan so kena ada wakil seorang pengurusan dan juga di peringkat lab Uh, sign officer, uh, research officer and uh, assist, uh, assistant uh, engineer uh, ni ada wakil lah so kita ada itu dia punya syarat dia minimum 2 uh, if less than 10 uh, 100 workers so it's mal bukan ada 40 40 uh, staff so minimum ada 2 daripada ni uh, daripada 
setiap setiap bahagianlah. Tak okey. 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 Saya nak tunjukkan Okey. Ah, uh, ya. Eh. Okey. This one eh. Uh, sebelum tu saya mengalu-alukan ke uh, kehadiran Dr. Ibrahim Uh, Dr Ibrahim uh, Muhammad Tahir dia daripada from Faculty Science dia after this dia uh, Dr Ibrahim akan akan bagi talk. Uh, okay, this one jatuh kuasa untuk tahun ni uh, pengurusnya pengurus dia Dr uh, Professor Madia Dr Janet uh, Dr Janet from Faculty Science also uh, I think some of you kenal kenal kena dia lah. Uh, saya sebagai teman-teman pengurusi setiausaha Puan Nolina Samsudin uh, ada kat sana baju baju hijau. Okey. This one uh, wakil majikan Cik uh, Perkuasaan Cik Nur Nazira binti Zulkifli. Dia daripada sekejap eh. Okey. Uh, Perkuasaan bila kiri sekali tu Pegawai Sains uh, Puan Sarinawani uh, Pegawai Sains daripada MSTL Yang bawah tu Pegawai Sains MPTL Puan Roslina uh, Abdul Tiga orang tu Pegawai Sains uh, Pegawai Penerbitan Actually Puan Mazianah dia dah pindah ke Ke bahagian lain Di, di UPM uh, PM APTJ lain lah uh, Dan kita ada seorang lagi wakil Penolong Yudhutra Encik Nazrul Abdullah Itu daripada wakil majikan ni, Yang ni wakil pekerja Kita ada uh, Empat orang daripada penolong Yudhutra Dan seorang daripada uh, Pembantu takbir uh, Muhammad Kadri Tadi yang baca doa tadi uh, Penolong Yudhutra Cik Zaki Yamani dia daripada MPTN uh, Penolong Jutra Cik Abdul Hafiz Yang Apa tu handsome tu uh, Senyum tu Yang duduk tu uh, Puan Tu Takbir uh, Puan Zam Dan juga penolong Jutra seorang lagi Cik Wafi dia From FDL Okay This one kalau Anything happen or anything kalau ada problem boleh contact inilah so kalau Okey selain tu kita ada ini catat ERT bukan JKKP lah ERT. So lebih kurang sama cuma bezanya kita ada bahagian tu bawah lah 
pengurusi masih uh, dipanggil Komander Eksiden, uh, Prof. Media Dr. Janet. Uh, saya sebagai Timbalan Komander. Pegawai informasi ataupun perhubungan uh, Puan Nolina Samsudin. Okey, untuk perancangan uh, Puan Ruslina, Ketua Operasi ERT, Encik Abdul Hafiz, Logistik Puan Sarnawani, uh, Bagai Kewangan Encik Dembe Ayub. First Aider, kita ada dua orang, uh, Puan Zam tadi dan juga Encik, Encik Halim. Uh, this one, kita tak boleh lantik sebarangan, dia ada dia kena pergi khusus. Dapat CJ baru baru ni lah, baru baru boleh lantik dia. So ada dua tu, Cik Zam uh, Zam Zurinan dan juga Cik Abdul Alim lah. Uh, yang lain pegawai uh, untuk pengungsian, uh, Cik Nur no, no, no Nazira, Cik Muhammad Kadri, Cik Zaki, Cik Nazro Abdullah, Cik Wafi, Cik Nur Azli, kawalan trafik dan juga Cik Muhammad untuk kawalan trafik lah. Uh, beza dekat situ je dia punya dia punya jatah kuasa so for uh, fire drill untuk fire drill jatah kuasa ni akan terlibat dia terlibat dia lain sikit fungsi dia uh, kalau kita ada latihan fire drill uh, dia orang lah akan, akan ni dan yang kalau ada kecederaan yang boleh merawat cuma Zam ataupun uh, Encik Hakim lah. Okey, terima kasih. Okey, better. Okey. Okey, sebelum saya saya uh, mengakhiri uh, taklimat saya ni so untuk pesanan kalau berlaku apa-apa sebab baru ni lebih kurang 2-3 minggu lepas berlaku kebakaran di di lab satu lab lah uh, actually saya rasa memang 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 tindakan tu daripada pihak daripada student memang baguslah tapi dari segi keselamatan uh, bagus ditinggal beritahu pada pegawai yang terlibat tadi uh, ERT ni beritahu dia dan dia akan ambil tindakan seterusnya sepatutnya student kena lari dulu selamatkan diri so for the next time saya dah fikirkan kalau ada sebab kita baru pasang alarm system So for the next time kalau ada bunyi tak ada dah tertanya-tanya eh, apa berlaku apa berlaku apa berlaku sebab kita dah jadi tiga kali selepas alam sistem ni uh, berjalan jika kita dah jadi tiga kali masih lagi eh masih-masih tengok kat bawah apa apa, apa berlaku apa berlaku staff pun sama staff pun sama student pun sama eh kenapa ada fire dia so for the next time kita tak tak ada dah benda tu saya tak nak dah benda tu kita ikut contoh di overseas apa saja bunyi, apa jadi ke tak jadi, kita lari dulu. Tinggalkan kepada orang yang bertanggungjawab. Okay. Uh, saya akan bincangkan dalam grup WhatsApp ini sebab baru ni jadi, saya rasa memang tak sepatutnya jadi macam tu. Masing-masing staff menyenguk, student pun tertanya-tanya. Dan yang ambil tindakannya bukan orang sepatutnya. So, it's not right lah. Uh, sepatutnya kita dah ada dalam sistem sendiri dan benda tu kita kena praktis kan. Uh, jadi ke tak jadi itu perkara kedua. Fire drill ke tak fire drill itu perkara kedua. Uh, so minta depan ni student uh, kalau apa-apa berlaku lagi dulu ke tempat berkumpul ikut pelan uh, pelan ni lah dia ada sediakan pelan untuk uh, laluan, pelan laluan. Okay. Okay. Uh, itu saja rasanya untuk pesanan yang saya lah. Uh, yang penting uh, keselamatan kena utamakan. Okay, that's all from me.
Terima kasih. Uh, saya serahkan balik kepada pengurusi majlis. Untuk next ni kita ada rakaman. Uh, InsyaAllah Tuan Tuan Ibrahim akan bagi talk yang lebih menarik lah. Okay, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mr. Mak Ali Rani for the talk. And we would like to invite our uh, invited speaker, Ms. Dr. Muhammad Ibrahim from Faculty of Science, UPM, to deliver his talk with a familiarization with hazardous and safety symbol. Please welcome. Okay. Right. Uh, repeat again. Uh, welcome to the uh, safety course from IPMA. I've given this talk before. Um, but just a question. How many of you are going to take uh, the course CHM 5002 next semester? Are you taking any of the safety course? Do you have, are you doing masters or PhD here? Masters. Don't you have to take any courses? You take from IPMA or engineering or from the Faculty of Science? I'm sorry? There's no response? You don't know yet? You're not sure? You just registered this semester, is it? Yes or no? Oh my god, okay, there's some response, huh? Okay, so, um, so if you're familiar, if you're going to be taking CHM 5002, which is for next semester, because I know some ITMA students do take them, um, I'll be teaching again that particular course next semester. That is actually a very, that's a lab safety course that uh, is for 14 weeks, okay? So basically, this is just a snippet of, uh, basically it's just to get you going into the lab, basically, some of the safety features. Um, how many of you are doing masters? Raise your hands. Okay, and PhD? Three, okay. Um, how many of you are from the, originally from UPM? Raise your hands. Oh. All right, so everyone's like really, uh, their hands are very hurting, tak angkat tinggi, eh? Okay, so penat sangat, eh, hari ini. Okay, so basically, um, if, why is the safety course very important, okay? Uh, for us at the Faculty of Science, I'm just going to a bit of a history. From the Faculty of Science, we have actually done the safety course for all new postgraduate students entering the lab, okay, for the last five, six, I think it's more than five years now. And I think ITMA caught on and they also feel it believes, I think UPM also believe that it's very important to have this course because if you join any kind of organization that deals, uh, any kind of organization, usually you have to go through a safety training course first in order for you to be um, allowed to work, okay? Especially in high-risk uh, environment like the labs, uh, factories, yeah? They're very particular about safety. Um, if you were to do uh, your degree, postgraduate degree, overseas, they're very particular, okay? My experience when I was doing my PhD, basically, I cannot go enter the lab without going through a safety course. Yeah, they, they're really particular. You go through a safety course, Either it's a one-day safety course that they explain to you what are the do's and don'ts, and then you have to sign a particular document saying that the employer has given, has given you the um, information about the inner workings of the lab and the safety. So that is a legal requirement, all right? If anything happens to you, the employer can say, yes, we have already told them, okay, these are the rules and regulation, they didn't follow, okay? So that's why it's very important now because um, uh, in Malaysia, we're, you're not yet a country which like to sue people. Sue, you know, we are very particular about like, redor, you know, kadar dan kadar, you know, uh, you know that kind of stuff. You know, redor lah, memang salah kita. So don't don't go to the uh, the lawyers. But if you're in the overseas, everything is taken into account. Okay, they will actually sue the employers if anything happens to them but the employers can go back and then they go through the form oh yeah this personality person has gone through the safety course we have told them what to do and what not to do and they have signed a document all right 
at the Faculty of Science, we have that. You know, the students, after they go through a uh, safety training course, they have to sign a document saying they have gone through and then they can enter the lab. I don't know about ITMA, how they're doing it. I'm not sure, but uh, that's how we do it at the Faculty of Science. You're doing a one-day training course, isn't it? Is it two days? One only end. And for us at the Faculty of Science, it's actually four days. Uh, it's a bit longer. And then at the end, they have to take a test. You know, they have a multiple choice test. Forgive me, I am sweating. Um, this is not because I'm nervous. It's just that because I'm big. <laughs> okay, that's the reason. Okay, so some of this, when you talk about safety, some of it is very, very logical. You know, things that you do and don't, you have to think a bit logically. You know, you don't run in the lab, isn't it? So some of it is very, very logical. So you'll see that uh, some of my comments, uh, the PowerPoint, you see, oh, yeah, that's something very simple. But you'll be surprised that once you get comfortable, you know, once you've been working after two or three months, you're used to the lab environment, you tend to forget, okay? You tend to take, take things for granted, okay? I've seen, you know, when I'm walking around the faculty, some students, the senior students, you know, after a while, in the beginning, they were all very particular, you know, always wear a lab coat, always wear uh, goggles, always wear closed shoes, but as the year progressed, they get very relaxed, and then they started not wearing lab coats, just wearing goggles when they do their wet chemistry. And start coming into the lab with uh, shoes that are open or wearing sandals. Or maybe, I've seen this before, um, students carrying Winchester bottle of solvent like carry, they're carrying a baby. You know what I mean? They carry the bottle like this. You know, like solvent, acetone, for example. What if he drops and they, they're walking along the corridor just holding it like that? That's not the proper way of carrying or handling a solvent bottle. You should always carry it with a carrier. There's a proper carrier that you carry, all right? And then uh, it's even dangerous when they carry it in, into the lift. You know, they carry a bottle of solvent unopened, carrying it like a baby, and go into the lift. What happens? The lift is a closed environment, all right? What happens if the bottle drops, you know? And then you're carrying people. Usually, um, in UPM, the problem is that we have some time limited. Um, space, uh, limited budget, so we're not able to uh, conform to exactly the rules and codes of the safety. So usually we have to make the best, and then we have to use logic, all right? Because I know that not all labs will have a, sh uh, a shower, okay? Basically, if you, op if you build a new lab, each lab, if it's especially a chemical lab, the most important, you have to have a shower, you have to have an eye wash station, those are the requirements. But sometimes, due to budgetary reasons, you cannot have that. So maybe uh, what we do is like, at least on one corridor, at the end, there'll be a shower, uh, there'll be an eye wash station, okay? So you, you have to, you have, it depends. But if, uh, to, give it to get it exactly, uh, to 100% tip-top condition is, is going to be very impossible for each organization. So each organization will have rules and regulations specifically to that uh, organization. So that's why it's very important you, for you to know what is available and what is not available at your lab. Okay? Okay, so basically, when we talk about chemical laboratory or any science laboratory safety, what you want is you want to be able to, the main definition, usually what people like to say is that it's the control of exposure to, uh, to potentially hazardous substance to attain an acceptably low risk of exposure. Basically, when you work, okay, so when you actually work in any environment, there's always going to be hazard, always. Okay? Nothing is 100% safe, all right? Anything that you do, I mean, uh, we're sitting here in this particular building, all right? Now you're sitting and you're listening to me. That's a bit of hazard, okay? The ceiling might fall, okay? You know, maybe your, um, your floor start, start to uh, deteriorate and have holes. That's what's happening in my lab at the moment, at the Faculty of Science. The, the <laughs> our floor is actually crumbling. So we have to actually move lab now, all right? So those are kind of, it's an old building. I don't know how, what happened. So uh, that's the story. So everything has a hazard. It's just that how we handle the hazards, you know? How do we minimize the risks, okay? Why is it so important, okay? Because it's for our own health, okay? It's the safety of the people working around us. 
safety of the community and the environment. Usually people do not think about the bigger picture, they always think about themselves, the safety to themselves. But when you work with chemicals in a lab, it does affect your surroundings. Okay? Maybe you're very careless, you, you, know, you, you uh, throw away your solvent down the sink, and where does the, that water go? It goes back into the environment. So actually, it has an effect not just for you, for the, your surrounding and environment. So that's why you have to be responsible. Okay? I think this is very important among Malaysians. We have to be responsible about when we, do, when we deal with chemicals. That's very, very important. Okay, sorry. This is what happens whenever I give a lecture. Okay? Usually I need a really, really cold room, but I know some people are a bit cold already. You know? Usually my, my lecture room are very, very cold. Okay? So, those things you have to think about when you talk about safety. One is hazard and one is risk. You'll see this word being repeated many, many times. Hazard and risk. Okay? But what is hazard? Hazard is a potential to harm. So, any chemicals that you're handling has its hazard. It's hazardous. What people say, oh, this chemical is hazardous. Every, every chemical has, uh, is hazardous. Okay? Uh, even water itself is hazardous. Okay? If, you, if the water touches sodium metal, it's going to be a problem, okay? It's going to be an explosion, all right? So in that case, water is hazardous in the case that if it's near to a sodium metal, all right? And risk is a word that we talk about the probability that it will harm will result. So a lot of um, study has been done. It's actually, you look at the hazard and how do we lower the risk of using that particular chemicals, okay? So... Hazard can be in different forms. The four that, has, that, we talk, that we're going to be talking about are chemical hazards, uh, physical, ergonomic, and also biological hazard. So I'm not sure which will um, apply to you. Uh, anybody going to be working with biological stuff in their PhD work? Any? Are you going to be working with mice? No? Nothing with biological like DNAs? No. So this is advanced material, and yeah, most of you guys are mostly going to be physical. So I think these three things are going to be uh, more uh, related to you, okay? The chemical, the physical, and the ergonomic hazard. So, so basically, as a researcher, as a scientist, you have to be able to uh, identify the hazards that you'll be working with, okay? The chemical toxicity, whether it has a, a, a fire explosion hazard, any physical hazard, any biohazard, radiation, especially. I, you guys are going to be working with anything with radiating materials? Anyone? No? Or do you, don't you know your work area already? Tak tahu lagi? You're still thinking about what research to do. You just come here, okay lah, let me do a master's. I don't care what I'm doing. Okay? I'm sure you had written a proposal, isn't it? Done. Okay? Um, Okay, so first we're going to talk about chemical to toxicity. This is quite important. With chemical toxicity, all right, there's the one that we call acute, which is uh, short term, and also chronic, long term. Okay, so sometimes that's why you, it's very important for you to remember you're going to be working in the lab. If you are doing a master's, it's going to be basically um, if you're going to be graduate on time, GOT, maybe. Four semesters, all right? That's the minimum. Well, so some good students can finish it in three semesters, all right? Or a PhD, a minimum of three, six semesters altogether. But that's very rare. <laughs> but usually three and a half or four, maximum four years, okay? And you'll be working with those chemicals for a long time, all right? Do remember some, hopefully, none of your chemicals will affect you in the long run, all right? But some chemicals, they take a while for it to interact with your body, okay? So you'll be working and working, and then after four years, you graduate, you don't feel anything, all right? But then maybe 10 years' time down the road, suddenly, you know, something happens to you, and you cannot pinpoint when did it happen, all right? So some will actually be long-term, and some will be very acute, short-term. Meaning once you work with the chemical, you can see it happening already, all right? So that's why it's very important to identify 
your chemicals. So usually when you order your chemicals, it will come with a safety data sheet. So I know most of you, in li literally, would not read the safety data sheet. You just take, okay, take from the spire, okay, that's it, put the safety data sheet in a file, fine. Okay, and you start working on it without looking at it closely, right? So that is very dangerous, right? Especially when you order new chemicals. You should always have a glimpse, not a glimpse lah, actually, the proper way is to read through the safety data sheet properly, look at it, what are the hazards, how do you actually going to be using those chemicals? That is very important. I always tell my student this. Okay, the safety data sheet is not just there for sure. It's not just, okay, put it in the file. But I know some of you will do that. Okay, it's the complacent. You get complacent and you just think, oh, okay, fine. I'm just going to continue um, doing your uh, work with the chemicals without knowing. You feel that you know the chemical is safe, but it, it comes with a hazard. Okay? All right, so you're working with chemical. You know that the chemicals is, have... It's toxic. All chemicals are toxic. It's just that some are less toxic than others. Um, but how do they get into your body? Right? So you can either be breathing it, okay? Uh, inhalation, absorption through your skin, right? Ingestion, injection, and eyes. Okay. I think these two, ingestion and injection, can, is, seriously, if this happened, that means you are really, really doing something wrong. How can you inject something in your body? Unless you say, okay, I want to be the guinea pig of my, react, uh, my experiment. I just want to test. Never test on yourself. Huh? Okay, at least you're not... Uh, this is particularly for people with, working with uh, biological samples. They use a lot of uh, syringe. So, you're going to have injections. All right? I don't think this happened. Ingestion is even worse. How do you get it into your mouth? Okay? Unless, you know, you were using bottles that to, uh, you're using normal bottles like your mineral bottle to put in your chemicals, okay, your solvent. And then maybe one day you forget about it and say, oh, mineral water. All right, whereas it was, you know, probably a, uh, a colorless, uh, it doesn't have a smell and you drink it and you'll die. Okay, so that's one thing. So I, don't, I think the only, the, uh, the most probable way of you being exposed to these chemicals are maybe these three, inhalation, absorption, and ice, okay? And those things, we have PPE to protect ourselves against those three types of exposure. But these two, I think it's very, very, if it happens, it shows that your level of cleverness, okay? Or, I don't know what to say lah. I think for the, the, the reward is actually stupid, like basically, all right? If you, if you do this, all right? Ingestion and injection. And then, as one of your, as uh, Mr. Ali has said again, this has already happened at ITMA, okay? Fire and explosion, all right? So this has, has, all, this has also happened in Faculty of Science as well, okay? We have had one explosion. I can't remember the date, okay? Um, it's very strange, eh? once, I don't know, once we started <laughs> applying a safety course, suddenly a lot of accidents tends to happen. I don't know why. Is it just, um, I don't know, uh, it's very crazy. We stay. Because when we didn't do the safety course, we didn't hear anything. Or maybe because people didn't report it. Uh, that's the thing. When things happen, people do not, do not report. Which is uh, something that is really, really wrong. Okay? In UPM, any accident that happened in the lab, even how small it is, you must report it to the science officer in charge of safety at that particular faculty. Okay, you must. Okay, so we can, once it's recorded, then we can take action and then we can do some prevention, uh, prevention for the future. Okay, that's very important. Uh, so here at ITMA, I'm sure Mr. Ali is one of the safety officers. You have to report to him. Okay? At the end of the year, we have to report to the OSH uh, department uh, uh, with regards to the, any accident that has happened. So a few accidents has happened at the faculty. So really, um, the safety course is very important. It shows that um, accidents do happen, and then um, you have to take, you ha we have to be accountable for those accidents. Okay? So when it comes to fire and explosion, three things that actually will make it worse. Okay, there are three little agents. One is oxygen, one is heat, 
one is fuel. If you have these three combinations, the fire triangle, explosion of fire will happen. So usually when you to, if you want to diminish the fire, you have either have to remove one of the components, either remove the oxygen or remove the heat or remove the fuel, one of them, so that you actually can uh, extinguish the fire. Okay? So uh, I'm sure at UPM, every year, uh, at least there should be one fire drill for the building that you occupy. There should be a fire drill training at least once a year. Okay? So pe people, we don't know when accident happen, we don't know how we're going to react. So practice make perfect. So that's why if there's a fire drill, please take it seriously. Think of it as, yeah, this is really happening. So you know what you're going to do. Okay, run out. Where is the assembly point? Okay, what you should, I should not do. Okay, what if happen if the fire is small? Are you brave enough to extinguish it? Or if it's too big, maybe most of the time we run away. Lah. Okay, not run, walk fast. Okay, I don't, I don't like to use the word run because run means that anything can happen. It's just walk very quickly. It's always walk very quickly. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. Power grid. This is going to look really bad on the video. I, that's why I don't like being videoed. <laughs> this is what happened. Okay. So, what about physical and ergonomic hazards? So, these are things like um, moving stuff. Okay. Even carrying. So, I'm sure you're going to be doing a lot of. Uh, carrying stuff uh, from one place to another. So you have to watch how you carry, you know, how you pick up stuff from the floor, how you put it on the rack. You know, that's also going to affect your back. So that's quite important. So uh, things like moving unguarded parts, um, broken glassware, this does happen in the lab, okay? Um, I'm sure in what your study here, you will probably break at least, must, you know? It's, uh, I'm sure you're going to break a beaker, or a conical flask in your years of studies, and then you don't, and then you quietly say, "Oh no," and then you don't put it in your logbook. You know, you quietly say, "Okay, I don't mind. Break one beaker. Uh, it's cheap. No, it's not cheap. Okay, I have a few when I was doing my PhD. It's a rite of passage, anyway. You know, things happen, but it's just that you have to. How do you clean it up? Do you mention it to your supervisor? <laughs> um, it depends. Okay, um, if it's something cheap, it's maybe you keep it quiet. But if it's something very expensive, that one you have to laugh, okay? And then biohazard. Okay, biohazard, I think, uh, doesn't apply to most of you. But if you are working uh, with biohazard, there's a whole new chemical anxiety. You cannot just, you can't, we can't talk it for the next two days, okay? It's, there's a different way of handling biohazard stuff, you know? Because you need a clean room sometimes, okay? The protection is much more... Um, there's much more protection that you have to wear when you handle with biohazard, okay? And you have to be the kind of person who is very, very careful when you do any kind of experiments involving uh, biomaterials, okay? So this one, if you, if you ever get, a, if, you, if you, in your research, maybe you're going to be probably working with uh, bio stuff, then definitely you have to go through another set of safety uh, talk on that particular material, okay? So be very aware of that. And then radiation hazard as well. Uh, some of you be working with x-rays. X-rays have radiation, okay? But um, a lot of our x-ray instruments, they're very um, well protected, okay? Usually, um, especially if you're working with a XRD spectrometer, our faculty has a single x-ray deflectometer. Um, is so... Uh, difficult to get radiation from that because the machine is already protected, okay? And um, if you open the, the machine, uh, it, it will always turn off the x-rays. It's an automatic thing, right? So it's very difficult lah, for you to uh, get uh, radiation from, uh, that's a, uh, from exposure to x-rays, uh, especially uh, unless you, be, you're working, you work uh, with x-rays day in, day out. You know, like maybe a uh, somebody who works in the hospital, the x-ray technologies, you know, day in, day out. So usually, people working with the x-ray, they will have day off. You know, like, after maybe seven days, they have two days leave, or a week leave, you know, so that get away from exposure, all right? Because this kind of thing will not, uh, if it, 
Exit will not, uh, it's like this. It's, it's, um, the, if you have anything happen to you, it will not manifest itself the next day. It will be like after 30 years of working, you know, suddenly you find, oh, I've got cancer, things like that. Okay? It could be due to uh, exposure to radiation. Okay? So, a radiation hazard in our a normal science lab, maybe from ultraviolet, okay, magnetic, if you use NMR, even microwave have a little bit of radiation. Uh, lasers, okay. I don't know, any one of you going to be working with lasers? No, you are. Uh, so, you have to be very careful. Usually, your room, uh, if you're working with laser, you work in a specific room. When the laser is on, there's a light outside, nobody can come in. That's one thing. And then, when you work, when you finish, then the light will be off, then people can come in. Once the laser is on, only you can be there, and you have to wear special eye protection as well when you're working with lasers. So there are different kind of eye protection for that. Okay. All right. So can we just take a five-minute break? Is that okay? Um, because there's, um, uh, I like to take five-minute breaks every half an hour so that I can get rid of this sweat, and then you guys can go to the toilet, whatever. Like, because you haven't had a five-minute break yet, and it's already one hour, okay? Let's stay for five minutes and come back about 11.05, uh, 11.10, something like that. Okay, thank you. So let's continue. So really, when we work, you are going to be working in the lab, and you know that this is a hands-on laboratory work, okay? You're going to be doing a lot of activities, uh, which requires the use of a lot of hazardous chemicals and very expensive lab equipment. That's one key thing eh, about working at UPM as well. If you're going to be working with a lot of expensive lab equipment, remember, you, when you work with those kind of equipment, you definitely need to, do, to know the SOP, the Standard Operating Procedure. Okay, students, remember, <laughs> here, if one equipment is broken, it will take a long time. Well, well I would say a long, a long time to get it fixed, okay? So budget, but you always have to do with budget as well. So, so really take care when you are dealing with uh, very expensive lab equipment. Right? Know the standard operating procedure. Ask people first how to use those particular instruments or glassware. Even some glassware are very expensive. Okay? And it's very, usually it's quite difficult to be replaced. All right? Because uh, each researcher will get a certain amount of money, and we put a certain amount aside, but not much, just a very small amount for repairs, and, um, and that usually does not cover if something big happened. Okay? Then when something big happened, then we have to request for extra funding, and usually that is the most difficult. Okay? For example, I can just give you an uh, example, like for the x-ray machine in our uh, building, um, every time when something happens, because it's already more than 10 years for the machine, of course, everything, after 10 years, usually things will happen, all right? It'll, you know, our machine is at the moment idle. It's because it almost, it's taking almost a year just to get funding, all right? To actually repair and replace certain parts of the machine. So, um, it's been very hard because we had to source out other universities to do our... Um, Analysis. So that just tells you that working in Malaysia, especially in most uh, private institu uh, normal institution, public institution, funding is always going to be a problem because we are governed by the government, you know, and then uh, it's always going to be less. So um, I feel that um, be, doing a research here in Malaysia is always going to be a challenge, but it's a good challenge because you have to be creative, innovative. How do we get away with? having just a small amount of money to do great research, okay? Because I, was, I studied abroad and I did my PhD and sometimes we are a bit over pampered. It's very easy to get chemical. It's very easy to get access to machine because they have a lot of money, okay? But nowadays, even Europe are having financial uh, difficulty. F uh, funding is also going to... They're getting into that situation where funding is also limited, okay? Um, so again, make science safety and delivery your number one priority. Okay? And then, it's, this is to ensure a safe working environment. Therefore, each lab will usually have a list of rules and regulation, and the institution or where you are will also have the general rules and regulation. But specific lab will also it has its rules and regulation as well, depend, depending on the layout of that particular lab. Okay? Uh, so you cannot just assume that maybe you are coming from you already been through this kind of safety course from another institution. 
you can't assume that those, yes, the general rules usually apply, but sometimes that particular has its own specific rules and regulation. So that's why when you go into any a new surroundings, new environment, ask the person who is already there, is there anything that I should know about the safety, or safety precautions that I have to take in order for me to be in this lab? So that's the first question you should always ask. Don't assume. That's the danger of it. Assume is very dangerous. Always ask. Okay? So that's why this course is very important to give you an idea what are the rules and regulations, especially tailored for UPM and especially ITMA itself. Okay? Again, rules must be followed at all times. So you cannot do this. You cannot have rules. Don't say rules are made to be broken. No, yeah? When it comes to safety, rules are not made to be broken. Rules in safety are made to be followed. All right? There's no such saying. You know, I know in television, movies, people say rules are made to be broken. Not in terms when it comes to safety. Okay? Right. So, what do you do in order to make, ensure safety when you're working in the lab? Always prepare a clean work area, all right? So, don't have this tendency to bring a lot of different things. Um, some of you, some labs have ample space, so you will have your bench work area, and you also have a desk somewhere else. Okay, the ideal environment would be um, you have a lab, uh, bench top, and then you also have a desk outside the lab, you know? So it's not, you, you don't do your reading, you don't do your writing on the bench top. You also have a separate place where you have a desk and a computer. So you're working in the lab, okay, do your experiments, whatever, but once you want to analyze data, you know, read, you go to your specific. So some lab have that ability. I don't know, here at IMA, do you have extra rooms, postgraduate rooms? I'm not sure, I'm not from this faculty. Okay, I'm not this institute, so I do not know. Um, but we know that some lab have limited space. So sometimes their bench top is also where they do their work. Okay, they're there from eight to five. They don't have a place where they can actually sit and relax and do their thinking, reading or anything like that. So basically, then you have to be very, very particular. Lah. You have to make sure that your work area is clean. Do not bring everything onto the web. Uh, the, the bench top. So I always ask my students, um, basically, luckily my lab, we have a, like a little small space. Uh, that one, I create a little room for them, okay? So that they can sit and put all their belongings there. So that their bench top is just their lab book and then whatever they're going to do, their experiments, okay? And especially in my lab as well, we have, it's a small lab, but we have a lot of students, okay? Especially when you have the project student coming in. So they also have to, there's sharing of the same bench top. So, it is even more important for you to be very meticulous, um, very clean, methodical of what, what you're using, so, so that everybody has the opportunity to use the bench top. Okay? Okay? So, these are, the, these, are, these are all common stuff you should know. Again, keep the aisles clear, do not run in the lab, uh, do not leave an experiment unattended. Uh, this is one of the things that Students like to do, especially when they do refluxing, for example. Um, so yes, you may leave stuff unattended, but you always have to leave a note, okay? And you have to make sure that everything is set correctly, so that and also inform somebody in, the, in that particular lab, especially if you're working um, in a lab and you leave your stuff unattended for a while, especially when you're done refluxing. You don't have to sit there. You know, Watch that. Usually, reflux can take, like, you do a refluxing for six to seven hours, you're not going to stand there <laughs> watching it, isn't it? You must probably just go and leave, go to the toilet or have your lunch, but you should always leave a note, okay? Say that, state what experiment you're using, okay? Um, so, definitely, the, the, the idea is actually to leave uh, what solvent you're using, write the chemical experiments, and then leave a note. Say you're doing this refluxing from what, from, for six hours, from what time to what time? And then always leave your contact number as well on that piece of paper and then leave it there. So that if anything happens, okay, so if anything happens, somebody can call or if something happens, they know what you were using. Right? For example, you were not there and then um, a little explosion happened. Okay? And then your friend wants to okay, help you uh, extinguish the fire. But he has to know which 
uh, fire extinguisher to use because depending on what material is in that particular round bottle flask, for example. So that's why it's very important to list out the chemical reaction that you are doing actually on a piece of paper and then um, usually this happens and when they do like 24 hour reflux and people leave it, uh, usually on the fume cupboard you must leave uh, a, a sign saying what is the reaction, how long, contact number. Okay, that is very important. You need to do that, get it into the practice. Keep aisles clear, although it's very simple, especially when you have labs, you have limited space, I know some lab will use, will use the aisle, okay, because they just don't have any space. Um, so they put stuff on it, but it's not the best, right? So that means that you have to be very clever about when you order solvents and everything. Look at the stock that you already have. If you don't have any place to place those extra solvent bottles, then don't order too much, okay? Just order enough. But I know some of you will say, oh my God, you know, the PO will take, I don't know, how many weeks, you know, if we order, if you order now one bottle or two bottles, let's order a few so that, you know, there's always going to be that. But remember, you have to have the space to put all those stuff, okay? You have to be very clever about that. So, be responsible at all time. So, um, this one, I can't stress uh, how much, okay? So, you have to be responsible. Don't play the blame game. All right? if you, and be honest about it. I know some students, when things happen, they get scared. They don't want to tell their supervisors. Okay? They keep it to themselves. All right? That's not the way. Okay? Of course, your supervisor is going to be mad. That you have to expect, lah, isn't it? But rather than just keeping quiet and not telling, that's even worse. All right? Because maybe that particular lab equipment is broken, and then you keep it quiet, and then you know, after months have passed, and then somebody wants to use it, and they found it broken. That's bad, okay? So that particular person, if you are told sooner, maybe that he can, or he or she, your supervisor can order a new one, all right? And just reprimand you for being so careless, okay? Accidents do happen, but be responsible for that action. Okay, follow guidelines. And another thing is never work alone, all right? So this one I really want to stress. Um, because there have been issue accident when things happen, because the, um, the student work alone, and what happened is that there's nobody around, okay? Especially when you work after six. Um, I don't know about ITMA, I'm sure ITMA also apply the same rules at the Faculty of Science. Uh, if you were going to be working after six, you must have a partner. So you have to have a friend who really <laughs> is Rajin juga lah. Memang Rajin, okay, let's work together after that. Because I know, because some experiments, require longer reflux time, longer reaction times, and it will take maybe more than just eight hours. So you can't really stop your experiment after a few hours, okay? All right? And um, if, you look, if you go overseas, the lab is actually open 24-7. There's always going to be that. It's only in Malaysia. I mean, our UPM, we don't allow that because um, we allow you to work until 11, all right? But then after that, you have to... Uh, get out <laughs> because we worry about the safety. We don't have yet the safety, uh, the tight, stringent uh, safety protocol. Okay, so that's why we limit the time. So the amount of work you can do is until about 11 uh, usually. But you still need to work with a partner, right? And then um, basically, if you work after six, usually um, if you work in a particular building, there will be a log book as you enter that particular building. So usually they don't ask you to sign in where if you're working from 8 to 5. But after office hours, you have to go down and write your name in the logbook. Because there will be usually a person in charge of the building. So if a fire happens, they know how many people is in the building. All right? Because you, you can't have somebody... How do people know how many people in the building? After, uh, during office hours, it's fine because there's a lot of people. So if anything happens, people can actually help. But after office hours, that's quite, because it's quiet, you know, the person in charge, you don't know who are in there. He can't, you know, if a fire happens, he can't go to each room and check. But if he knows, oh, there's actually uh, two people working in this particular lab. So he knows directly if anything happens to go and search for those people. Okay? That's very important, yeah? To log in after office hours. And this is, of course, lah. No eating and drinking, okay? But as I said to you before, <laughs> this does happen, complacent. Yeah? And then um, sometimes people like to chew gum in the lab. They don't think that's eating, 
But imagine, if every time you open your mouth, uh, if you're working with something which is uh, uh, have high vapor, you know, you keep getting in all that vapor into your system. All right? No. When I say no drinking, no eating, that means no drinking and no eating. Anything. All right? So do it outside the lab. Please don't. All right? Um, okay, this one I've already talked about. Okay, so again, it's very important. If anything happens, notify your supervisor. Okay, that's very, very important. And um, get into the habit that after every time that you work in the lab, once you go in, because remember, um, in lab us, it's not the most cleanest environment. It's, that's wrong, English wrong. Not the most clean environment. Okay, it's not the cleanest environment. Okay, every time you go in, you might be touching, holding something. So get into the habit every time you go out, wash your hands. All right? Get into that particular habit. Like a doctor, all right? just always wash your hands. Come in, go in. Once you enter the lab, you, you, know, things might, you never know where you touch your hands. And how do you know that your colleagues or your friends clean their workspace very, very well? You do not know. Okay? Um, and then you have to remember uh, some of our buildings are quite old. You might get some rat infestation as well, okay? They might be scouring the table, and they might pee on the, uh, on the bench top. It's already dried, you never know. And then you start holding and then touching your face, you know, like things like that. So I have this habit, because in my, even in my office, we have a bit of a rat infestation problem. Uh, one day I saw, oh my God, you know, like my rubbish bin was all out. I knew there was a rat. So nowadays, every time when I go into the office, I, I get a clean, first wipe my table, because I don't know, they might just, they don't do anything, but they might be touching, right? Because I know there's a rat. Um, so, I get into the habit of wiping my table every time before I start work, just in case, all right? Because they might pee and you don't know, because if it's dry, you can't really see, okay? All right. One thing is to dress appropriately, okay? Let's go dress appropriately. Um, some of you I can see wearing um, glasses, all right? So um, if you're working in the lab, don't wear uh, contact lenses, okay? That's a no-no because if anything happens, it's very difficult to remove to your eyes. Um, and then your glasses, I know some people like me, we tend to think for granted because we already wear our glasses, we think this is our safety glass. It's not, okay? Um, you can, if you want to convert your glasses into safety glasses, just have to go to a specialist store and then ask them to actually put uh, uh, some form of, uh, uh, what do you call I can't forget the word. You put a protector at the top and at the side, okay? Because if you think that you're going to be working in a lab environment for the rest of your life, maybe it's a quite a good investment to do that. That means that you don't have to, every time you go into the lab, you have to take it off, put yours. I don't like putting my safety goggles on top of my glasses. Again, you have double vision, <laughs> double, double, uh, double vision, not, it's not double vision, you know. It just makes it very uncomfortable and it gets really hot. Um, so I do have a glass, especially, uh, not this one, that is a safety glass and it has power. So that when I go into the lab, I use that one. Okay, so that I don't have two on top of the other. But because I've been working for the rest of my life here at UPM, I'm, Research, so that's why I invest. It's not very expensive. Uh, Co-op, near Co-op, there's a, a optician there again. There is an optician there. It's very cheap, and they actually do. Um, you can get it for two hundred ringgit. Two hundred. I mean, not the most expensive one lah, but two hundred ringgit. You can have them do the safety glass. Okay, so you don't have to wear uh, on top of the other, on top of your own glass. Okay. Um, okay, you don't have problem with wearing shorts. Uh, because UPM don't allow that. Um, sandals. Sandals is the one thing that I really get to me with the student, especially the girls. Okay? They love to wear sandals that is you know, open. Okay? It's not allowed. Eh? It has to be closed to shoes. And again, uh, because we are, a lot of girls are wearing tudong, right? so when you wear your lab coat, the tudong must be in. Okay? There must be tudong on it. It cannot be flapping around. Okay? Don't have styles. Lah. Okay? So it must be the lab coat must cover the tudong actually. Okay. So if you see a lot of these signs, usually 
the sign that is in blue, blue colored, meaning you have to follow. All right? If anything is in blue, like this, it means you have to follow. So usually when you go into certain labs, they will have this sign like, eye protection must be worn. Okay, lab coat must be worn. And they will tell you an exclamation mark whereby something about shoes or something like that. So you see a lot of these blue signs. If you use the color blue, usually it means things must be followed. All right? So you have to. So the personal protective equipment covers eye protection, gloves, laboratory coats. And the laboratory coats are not the short sleeve one. Eh? If you have one, you cannot wear that. Okay? You have to have the long sleeve ones. Um, Respirator, if you're working with very volatile uh, compounds, okay, uh, that appropriate food protection. Okay, I know this is uh, in, also an engineering faculty. Sometimes in engineering faculty, they also work with heavy equipments as well. So normal shoes are not, not appropriate. They have to wear the one with the steel uh, so that if anything drops on them, uh, it will not crush their feet. Okay, so... I want to ask first, have you been into the lab? Have you been in your lab? Have you? Really? You have started your experiments? Have you or not? Yes or no? <gasps> you can't. You haven't gone through the safety course. So this is wrong. Salah again. Sorry? Are you sure? But how, when you take your samples, how do you take your samples? Do you know how to handle them appropriately? Did you, did you have the SDS sheet? Do you know what the safety data sheet for your materials? What materials did you actually... Sorry? Tak dengar lah. Mill scale? What is that? Sisik besi? Okay, I don't know. That's not my research area. So when you... So your lab, you've been into the lab. You have been into your lab. Where's your lab? Sorry? Here. What is, that? what is MSL? Who's your supervisor? Dr. Rama? Oh, I don't know her. Okay. So, so when you go into that lab, did you notice anything? What is the first thing you see? Okay. I have to sit down. I have a bad knee. Okay. What is it? When you actually go into the lab, when you go into the lab, what things do you see? First thing you do, the first time you enter your lab, the lab. What things? The first thing you do. You wear your lab coat. Very good. Anything else? You, the mask. You mean the full mask? No, no. Goggles. Or the mask. Why do you need the mask? Why do you need a mask in your lab? Oh, it's a waste. So it has a smell. Oh, the particles, the dust. All right, so it's very fine. So you don't want, it to, you don't want to, you know, breathe it in. Okay, so good. You, so you know your materials, so you're wearing a mask. Anything else? You wear glove. What kind of glove do you use? The blue one. Is that good enough to protect you? Really? Are you sure? Or you want to weigh? Just weigh. Oh, okay. Anything else you notice about the lab when you go in? No. Okay. How about you? Have you been to the lab? Yes. Okay. So what's your lab's name? Oh, you're doing at FRIM. Oh, okay. Oh, you're a FRIM staff. So they, of course, have safety as well, then. You've gone through this kind of course at FRIM. Is there this kind of course at FRIM? Kursus macam ni ada tak di frame? Ada ke tak ada ni? Saya so call frame sekarang? Macam mana? Ada ke tak ada? Honestly, is there this kind of course at frame? So meaning if a new staff member join at frame, so they can just go straight away and work? Really? Betul macam tu kan? Honest lah, betul ke ya? Yes, macam takut je nanti kan, benda ni recorded kan, and then put out and then, oh, habis lah kan, okay. So that's not right actually, actually, you know, uh, they should actually have. So nobody actually, 
uh, okay, you just join frame. Okay, these are the do's and don'ts, regulation. Nobody say, do that to you. Just remind, but never through proper cause. So, so what the, is the first thing when you enter the lab? What is the first thing you do? You can speak Malay if it's very difficult. It's okay. I do understand Malay. Okay, she, the first thing she does is, because she, she works with a lot of chemicals, she um, go through the STS sheet for each of the chemicals that she will be using. Is that it? Correct. Okay, that's what she does. Uh, how about you at the back? I'm sure you also have been to the lab. Ah, yes. What do you do? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Right, now let me ask you another question. Okay, if you go onto a flight, okay, you go onto a flight, okay, you want to fly somewhere beautiful for a vacation, what do actually the steward and stewardess do at the beginning of the flight? Sorry? Alright, they do their safety check, kan? They will tell you what will happen, okay? What should you do in case of an emergency? Or where are the safety exits are, okay? So it's the same thing sh that should happen if you're the first time entering a lab. The first thing you should do, <laughs> I think the first thing you should see is actually look at the layout of the lab first. Okay, where are the safety exits? I think I would do that because just in case if anything happens, I know where to get out. Right? So basically, each lab should always have two doors. That is the regulations. Okay? That is the real regulation because I know, but I know some UPM lab, they tend to have actually only one door because it's just the way it's, it was original. So we have to make do. But, origin, uh, but for safety reason, actually, um, any chemical lab, any laboratory should have always two doors. You know, because if one exit is kind of on a fire, has a fire, they have another way of coming out. The next thing you should always think about, where are the safety features in that particular lab? Is there a safety shower? Where is the eye wash? Where is the SOP, the guidelines, rules and regulations for that particular lab? Okay? Where is your, the fire extinguisher? You should know where it is. And is there a safety kit? Where is the spill kit? Okay? Where do you throw your waste? All those things. You should always look at the safety feature first before you even talk about your chemicals and stuff. So what I see just now is that you just go in without knowing nothing. Okay? If I ask you to now envisage your lab just now, do you know where is your fire extinguisher? Just, where is the fire extinguisher? Can you remember? Do you know where it is in the lab? Is there a fire extinguisher in the lab? Tada! <gasps> you do not know. You don't know again. Huh? See, if anything happens, you don't know. You panic because remember when accident happened, the normal um, uh, reaction by people is a slight panic. You're always going to be panic. You know, you're going to always going to be shocked kind of, because something has happened, you panic and you think about, <gasps> okay, then you start, okay, now you do this. But if you're already in your mind, you know where your fire extinguisher is, you know where to go. All right? And if anything happens to your friend, for example, where is the first aid kit? All right? And also, each lab should have um, uh, like a little poster that tells you the emergency numbers just in case you need to call, all right? Who is the contact person, okay? Um, so those are the things that should be in the lab that you should always notice the first time you enter, okay? The first time you enter, these are the things you should be aware of, yeah? The safety uh, stuff that should be in that particular lab, such as your safety shower, I wash, fire blankets, if there's a fire extinguisher, where are the fire exit, okay? Uh, I know some that do not have telephones, okay, because nowadays most of us have our own telephone, okay? First aid kit and also the spill kit. Also, you should always check your first aid kit as well because it has a, uh, what do you call it? A, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, expiry date. Yes, some of the stuff in there 
can expire. So the first thing you, you go into like always check this thing. Where are those things? Is my first aid uh, if it has expired, you should always inform the technical officer in charge of that lab. Say, oh, sorry, yeah, our first aid kit is already expired. Can we have a replacement of a new one? Because remember, we do not know when accidents happen. Okay? Okay. So, um, so we do have this thing. Okay, if you have to use a fire extinguisher, because I know some of you have, have you had experience using a fire extinguisher? No. Okay, usually the first time you'll be using it is usually when the fire has happened, all right? But um, uh, at our faculty, we, have do, we also have training of using a fire extinguisher during the safety thing. We allow the students to actually use the fire extinguisher, the one that has already expired. We tend to, we don't uh, send them back, we ask you use it for the safety training. So these are the things that you need to use to understand how to use a fire extinguisher. Just remember PAAS, pass, okay? Uh, so you pull the pin, right, and then you aim where the fire is. This, you only use a fire extinguisher when you feel confident, when the fire is small, not when it's too big, all right? When it's just a little small fire, all right? But when it's big, don't even attempt. Just get out of that room. Don't be, you know, some superhero, whatever, okay? Trying to, okay, yeah, I can do this, you know? Because you never know, all right? If it's a small little fire, and you feel confident, you yourself must be confident about using the fire extinguisher. This thing, uh, you can just remember the word pass. Yeah? You pull the pin, you aim, and then you squeeze the handle, and then you sweep. Or some people use spray. Lah. You sweep. That's how the motion. P A double S. Okay? And then, if for example, your friend is on fire, or you yourself on fire, I know once you're on fire, you panic, can? Okay, what are the three things that are needed for the fire to grow? Oxygen, heat, and fuel, all right? So one thing you can do is you want to muffle the fire. So the thing you do is, uh, one thing that people do is always, if you feel you have a lab coat on fire, if you are actually on fire, the, the thing you need to do is actually just drop and then start rolling. So when you start rolling, you're trying to muffle the oxygen, yeah? To get to the, that's what you're trying to do. You know, as much as possible. That's the thing. So you drop, stop, drop, and roll. If you you have a colleague, your friend, maybe they have a. If you have a fire blanket, that's what you do. You put the fire blanket on top of that person to uh, suffocate the oxygen, right? So they don't have. It doesn't have that accelerant, okay, for it to grow even bigger. So drop, stop, drop, and roll. Okay, uh, remember this. Okay. Right. What happens if you have spills or accidents in the lab? So these days, most lab will have a spill kit okay, in the lab. Does your lab have a, have a spill kit? Okay, you didn't, you didn't know. So you don't know. She doesn't know where she, everything is. Okay, very dangerous. Okay. So usually they have a spill kit. It's in a yellow, it's usually in a yellow tub. Okay. Uh, so in there, there are things that can be used if you have major spills okay, to contain the, the spill. Um, but if things, if you have a spill, you have to clean up immediately. Don't, don't just leave it there. All right, don't just especially. Uh, so you do, you clean up, spill immediately. All right, glassware. That's another thing. You always when you finish your day, get into the habit that after you finish the day, if you have any glassware that you have used, always wash it and leave it to dry. Always have a clean bench at the end of the day. All right. Clean up the work area, return all equipment and materials to its original place. And each lab should have what we call a chemical waste bin, all right? To put anything that has harmful chemical substances. Because in your lab, you're going to have a general waste basket for general waste that has nothing to do with chemicals. And then another chemical uh, waste uh, bin that is for chemicals. Like maybe you use a filter paper and that filter paper had chemicals on it. You don't put it in the general waste. Okay? Because usually the general waste is being picked up by normal general cleaner outside. You put it outside the lab can, they will pick it up. It's not fair to them if there's going to be chemicals in there because they don't know any better, isn't it? So I have found this happening, you know? I go through and I see my students putting, you know, normal chemical waste into the general waste bin. I said to them, you're not very responsible. This is going to be picked up by a normal General cleaner, and usually what do the general cleaner do? They sometimes go through the rubbish can to pick up stuff that can be like bottles or whatever. Then their hands will touch. 
So you are not being very responsible. So be, be aware of what kind of waste you're throwing. Okay? Use the prop, appropriate uh, uh, bins okay, for each one of them. And then this is the thing. Okay? You don't want this to happen. I know this will be very good to tell your, your lecturer, your supervisor, oh my God, I'm working so hard. Look at this. I don't even have time to clean. You know, like, look at all the chemicals I'm using. And then show all this. Okay, when the student... <laughs> When the lecturer comes, look, I'm reading so much. Huh? I'm reading all these papers. I'm preparing a, a long-winded review paper, you know, just to show <laughs> to your supervisor, no. If I see this in my lab to my students, I say, you're very lazy, okay? I tell them, this is, uh, this is not being systematic, okay? Or if they say, they, <laughs> if they prove to me that, oh, yeah, do it. okay, give me the results. Okay, if you're working really, really hard, okay? That's one way to put them uh, in their place. Okay, another thing, some of you will be working in fume hoods as well. So another thing about using fume hoods, all right, fume hoods are not storage area. I know some labs, they tend to make it a storage area where they put their solvent in. It's not, okay? It's a place, it's another bench top to work with volatile substance or things that smell really, really bad. Okay, you want to work in the fume hood so it doesn't actually uh, affect the whole lab, okay? So you work in the lab, in the fume hoods. I know students, when they work in, the, in fume hoods, they tend to push the sash straight to the top. You're not supposed, the, the fume hood, the idea is to protect you. Maybe you're working with very um, volatile substances that has a possibility of explosion. So when you work, you, you, your hands should be underneath the fume hood. The sash should be down. So if anything happens, the, it will, the glass will protect you. All right? That's the idea of working in a film hood. It's not that to have it open all the time. When you're working, that's wrong. Okay? When you're working, you push it toward the down, so your hands are like underneath, you're working in it, and then uh, once it's finished, uh, then if you want to take it out, well, just push it out. It's not always open, it's always closed. Okay? The idea is that if anything, explosion happens, the glass will actually protect you. Okay? This has happened at the faculty. One student did a work, luckily, all right, the sash was actually protecting him. If not, everything would have gone onto his face. Okay, because he was just wearing goggles. Yeah, goggles protect the eye, but not the beautiful face that he has. Okay, so he was very lucky. Okay, so in a, in a sense, the causes of accidents are usually, I, I think most of the time, it's actually human error. Okay, they're indiscipline, lack of adequate knowledge for dealing with the chemicals, uh, lack of poor facilities, and this, yeah, this you can say maybe the management issues, lah, all right? Because they're not providing, you know, the appropriate safety features in that particular lab. But the main factors are usually the human error. Okay, students are not following procedures. Okay, so again, let's look at safety signs. So this is the thing when you go into lab, you're going to see a lot of safety signs, kan? Some are in red, some are in green, some are in yellow. Okay, but anything that is in blue, that means you have to comply. Okay, so anything in blue, you have to comply. You have to say, you have to do what it is asking you to do. Um, yellow signs are usually warnings. Okay, if you see signs that are in yellow, are usually warnings. So you know, oh, this, or oh, something might happen, like dangerous, danger acid, or in front of the door, there's laser hazard going in. Green signs are usually safety guidance. Right? So your, uh, your safety exit sign is always usually in green. And it's quite universal throughout the world. Okay? So that if you're in any building, you're working in any building, these are the colors that people actually use. Now, although we speak different languages, we understand what the color means. Right? So that is universal throughout the world. So people know, oh, yeah, when you see green, it always means safety. All right? So something that, okay, oh, this is the way out. So you know uh, the right fire exit. And then, of course, the dreaded red sign. It usually means prohibitive. Okay? If you see, I think red, uh, red sign is usually danger. Okay? And uh, are very prohibitive, meaning you can't do it. Okay? You, use a, you won't use green, isn't it? Say, say, imagine this color, no smoking in green. It doesn't work, isn't it? Okay. Suddenly, you're at one institution, you say, ah, I don't want to follow universal color. I want to use pink, orange, purple for my signs. Yeah, you can't do that. You have to use the standard universal color to mean different things. So red, people have used, it means prohibitive. 
all right? So anything with red usually means in danger or means something that you cannot do, okay? And you also see other common symbols. This is basically um, on your uh, chemical bottles. Uh, so recently, nowadays, people use the global, globalized, harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. They call it GSS, GHS, Globalized Harmonized System. You'll see that um, the new bottles tend to have the latest symbol, the GHS symbol. But some, if you're in the lab and you have old chemicals, the symbol will be slightly different, a different color. All right? Uh, but it still means the same thing. But this is the current recent one that people have um, come up with, a standard that all over the world are using. This is uh, usually on chemical bottles for labeling the uh, of, uh, chemicals. And then you also have other symbols as well for transporting. Usually, tr if you're going to transport something, there's actually more information on the labeling. So this is usually just on the bottles, okay? On the chemical bottles, they use this symbol. And then, of course, uh, another thing that is quite important is the safety data sheet. It used to be called the material data sheet, uh, data, material safety data sheet, and before that, it usually was also called the chemical safety data sheet. But nowadays, people just ramp it up, safety data sheet, okay? But they all are almost the same thing, okay? The safety data sheet is just the updated, late, it's the latest, so that it's standardized throughout the world, okay? So if you see MSDS, it's, it's the same as SDS. If you see CSDS, it's the same. It's a chemical safety data sheet as well. Yeah, it's just another name for this, okay? And then usually, the safety data sheet for a particular chemical can be found online, okay? People have put it online. Um, if you have an old sample and, uh, in the lab and you look and check in the file, it doesn't have a safety data sheet and you want to know, okay, before you use that particular chemical, you can find it online as well. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about so much about the safety data sheet because in the afternoon there's a session where they explain everything. But the safety data sheet comes with a lot, a lot of information. Okay, it tells you what chemicals are in the product, what is the maximum amount of each chemical you can legally be exposed to, is the product a fire or explosion hazard? Does it? How does it enter your body? That's very important. How can it affect your health in short term and also long term? Um, what protection must be the employer provide, okay, if this chemical requires specific protections? Uh, how do you handle the product safely? That is also very important because some chemicals require very specific way of handling it, yeah? Maybe the chemical, you have to work in an inner environment, meaning you have to work in a vacuum box. You know, even with a little amount of air, it will can explode, all right? That's why um, when... Um, any of my, my students who wants to start up their research, they usually have to give me a plan, all right? They have to show me the synthetic route, what solvents they are using, all right? So we understand the chemical reaction first, what chemicals they'll be using, and then check, is there any um, uh, problems with using this chemical with this chemical? Sometimes they are incompatible, they cannot be used together, because if you use it together, it explodes. So you have to understand your reaction, don't just it's not like cooking, all right? Yeah, you, you need to know, are the chemicals compatible or not, or incompatible, all right? And then, some chemicals require really, really uh, special handling, meaning, oh, these chemicals cannot be done in a room environment. You have to be inert. You have to flow uh, nitrogen gas. So those are the things that you have. You can t it will tell you in the safety data sheet, okay? So, in the end, what is actually your responsibility, okay? Follow the policies, right? Wear your PPE, that's very important. Report accident. Learn about your hazard of specific chemicals, the one that you want to use. If you feel there are some changes or improvement that will actually help, those are something you can suggest to your supervisor. Basically, in you working in that particular lab, you feel that oh, maybe uh, this probably help in terms of making the lab more efficient, something you can suggest. Um, work safely. The other, one important thing is think about other people than yourself, okay? Whenever you do something, think about, okay, what can happen? Does this affect the people surrounding me, okay? If anything happens and it was your, it was your, 
you were responsible for it and it affected your friend, you'll be feeling guilty for the rest of your life because you were careless. You didn't take enough precaution and the explosion happened, it affected your friend. It was not even the friend's issue. Okay? He was working quietly in his own bench top and suddenly you, your experiment exploded. It affected him and not you. Okay? How would you feel? You feel guilty for the rest of your life because it was your mistake. Okay? All right, and encourage good safety and security. Another thing is about security because I know here in Imar, very good because you have this touch card. Nobody can actually access, okay, easily into your lab, isn't it? True? You have to have that. That's why you come here again because if you, don't, if you don't have the access card, okay, then you cannot go into your lab. Very, very clever of them. Um, but I know that certain lab, like my lab, we don't have that, you know, and then I always tell my students as well, nobody can actually come in into the lab without your permission, okay? Because they do not know the safety picture of that lab. Yeah? You can't just ask them to walk in and you know, sit there and talk. If you need to talk to that friend, do not do it in the lab. Do it outside, okay? Because you're endangering them as well because they do not know what are the chemicals or what things are being used in that particular lab. So you have to be very, uh, you know, you can just not allow anyone. And then behave very responsibly, okay? All right, so I'm going to ask, all right, I'm going to sit down again. Um, just things about this picture. Can you check, can you think about things that are wrong with this picture? Okay. Can, you, can, you, can somebody at the back see? Betul, boleh nampak? Boleh, eh? Okay. Anything wrong with this particular picture? Can you see the fault? Yes, he's, he's not wearing the proper PPE, okay? There's no goggles. The, he's wearing an apron rather than a lab coat. Okay, that's wrong. Okay, that's PPE, one thing. Any other thing? Sorry? Yes, he's, you, he's handling electrical with a wet hand. Okay, the water is dripping. Anything? Sorry, any, over there? Protruding object, if you look at the right hand side, you have the knife, okay? Um, you should never be pointing towards the aisle, you should always be pointing in. Anything? Yes, so it is not the placement of materials. In this case, it's a solver bottle, isn't it? It's at the edge. Um, anything else? Yes, he's using the eye wash uh, place uh, for his lab coat stand. <laughs> you know, there should be a proper place to put, not on the eye wash, okay? The depan kawan kita ni gelap kat depan. So, maksudnya, awak buat ke? Do you do that in your lab? Uh, betul ke ni? Senyum-senyum tu macam, I did it lah. Uh, okay. No? Sorry? Funny, okay. It is funny, isn't it? But when the accident happened, it's not funny. <laughs> okay? Anything else? Apa lagi? I think there's one more. Yes, yeah? So whenever you use a chemical, that's actually a heater at the middle he's trying to put in. And then if that's an open material, it could be a solvent or whatever, and it's close to the heat source, okay? So that's very dangerous. Whenever you use something, once you've taken it out, you have to close it. Always keep everything screwed. Huh? Uh, the tab, I think the... the, the the cover, the cap is closed, okay? All right, what about this picture? What's wrong with this? I'm, on, I'm sure you see it, okay? Kena adalah participation. Yes. Yes. Chat. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's okay to chat. Okay. It's okay to have a chat. But when, when you're chatting, maybe don't look at that particular person. I mean, you do your work, but you chat, you know, like you look at your, what you're doing. But you can still talk, but make sure that you look at what you're actually doing. Okay. Anything else?
Come on. Ah, that guy over there, huh? PPE, yes, that's obvious, okay? None of them is wearing PPE. The girl has very long hair. He, she should have tied it, okay? Anything? Sorry? Direct heating. You're thinking about direct heating. Okay, so she's, they're working with open flame here. Uh, these days, we rarely work with open flames any, a lot. Yeah? We don't, uh, even in our undergraduate lab, we don't usually work with open flames anymore. We tend to have a mantle, a uh, heat mantle, because uh, a lot of our, this, this is, can be quite dangerous. Okay? So he, they're working with open flames, and then the tube is, the test tube is pointing towards the, the friend. Okay? You should always point away if you're heating anything. Okay? It looks simple, but this is, you know, if, any, if it bubbles up, it will straightly hit her. Okay, anything else? Ah, Japan, can you see anything? Okay, so the messiness of the bench top, all right? So basically, you, can, you should have a tube rack. This should be in the tube rack. You know, you have rubbish on the table. Imagine this is an open flame. Okay, anything, you know, what if the, well, I don't know, like if it travels and catches it fire. And then, uh, you know, she was talking so much, she, she didn't realize there's a measuring cylinder with solvent there. Okay? All right, how about this? Sorry? Smell, okay. You should never smell. You could do it, you know, there's a way of doing smelling. You should always fart and just waft it once. That's it. Sometimes you do need to know about the smell of your, your material, but you don't do, oh, you know, that's not the way, you know. Really get the full smell. You just, a whiff of it, you know, a far, just a whiff. Uh, so you can do that, but this is like, maybe, maybe they're doing some ester, you know, ester a very nice smell, very sweet smell. Uh, maybe they do that, but no, you should never do that in the lab. Yeah? You should never straight put it in towards your nose. Um, anything else? Sorry? Food, yeah. So they are actually eating and drinking. Okay, no, probably just drinking in the lab. Okay. They're wearing partial PPE. They're wearing the goggles, but again, I think maybe this way, uh, they're wearing, um, they're wearing uh, gloves, but you can see this is exposed. So you can have exposure to the skin. Yeah, if anything happens. That's why you need to wear long lab coats, all right? Um, again, the bench top is quite messy as well, okay? You should always be clean and keep a clear table, all right, for your uh, bench top. Okay, so again, uh, it's 12 now. So can we take another? It was about one hour already again. I need a break. So can we take another 10-minute breaks? And then we'll come back. Uh, then we'll finish it off. Because I before we was we waiting for a friend. Can I just let? I just want to get to know you a little bit better since we are very small. Because last time I came here, there seemed to be more students, but I'm quite surprised this time. It's only a few. Um, so can you tell me your name and what research are you doing? Oh, okay. Wow, amazing. All right. And were you from UPM before? Oh, which faculty? Physics? Oh, physics. Okay. And you? Uh -huh. Physics department. Oh, physics department. And yourself? Ceramic. And were you, where were you before? Masters. Uh, and before that? Oh, you am. Okay, so you just con you finish your masters, and then you're continuing to do your PhD. All right. And who's your supervisor? Oh, Dr. Amran. Oh, he used to be the head of the department, can? Yeah, I know him. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Rizwan. Uh huh. Oh, uh, Jatropa. Uh, I, I know people working in it. Is it. Who's your supervisor? 
from chemical engineering as well. And were you, where were you before? UniKL. Okay, how different is it UniKL to UPM? So safety is way better. Wow, that's a statement there. Okay, right. Okay, next. Why are you looking? There's nobody at the back. Okay. And Nama, your name? Katija. Oh, and Moffe, you're one of them all. Who's you working with? Oh, Dr. Soraya. So you're going to a workshop next week, can? The one whole week to MOF workshop, to, or you're one of the students. Lah. Yeah, I'll be there as well. All right, and you? Sorry, where were you before? Where were you before? Oh, ICL. Wow, so you did your degree there. Okay, so how do you find it now? I want you to, to do a comparison because I also graduated from overseas. So, but that was years ago. You just graduated, is it? 2016. Where were you before, after that? Two years. And you didn't like working. Economics and policy, where? <gasps> and why did you join? Why did you want? Why didn't you stay there? PwC is a, such a very great company. Boring, or you don't like to be in the cons You want to do things, stuff, is it? Okay, so compare when you did your. Did you do a chemistry degree or chemical, chemical engineering? Okay, so how, how do you compare now? <laughs> Facility wise, be honest. <laughs> Budget constraint, yes. You can see. <laughs> okay. So, because you know, like, you, you're coming from overseas, kind of, sun is another part, chemicals, it's easy and everything, isn't it? Okay, so, but it will be a challenge for you to adapt, all right, especially in this Malaysian science environment. But do remember, you can still do great stuff here. People have done great stuff and won awards. Huh? Okay, sorry, back to you. Electrodes. Okay. What? Okay. I see. What's your name? And where are you from before this? UKM. Why did you move to UPM? Oh, and UKM doesn't? Oh, it does happen as well at UPM, okay? Any public university is the same, okay? All right, and yourself? I know you. Nama? Levina. Do you know me? Okay. Okay. Who's the supervisor? Oh, I know. When you talk about water, I already imagine myself, uh, Dr. Halim, yeah. And you? And you're working at Frame. Your research is at Frame. Oh, no, it's yours, Frame. Okay, sorry. And who's your supervisor? Kamirul from the physics department. Lah. And were you, where were you before? You're MP. So you're on, you're, in Michigan, you're doing PhD, isn't it? So you're a tutor there. So after finish, you back, okay, future lecturer lah, basically, lecturer slash researcher lah, okay, and yourself? Uh -huh. Oh, for wood preservative, and uh, all your research is going to be based at frame, everything. Oh, for characterization, you come here, and who's your supervisor? Hey, he's still around? Oh, he's still around, okay. <laughs> he used to be at the Department of Chemistry. Oh, he's still around, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And yourself? Drug delivery uh, with Prof. Azala. Uh, okay, you are previously at UPM, okay. All right. So, no, I, because it's a small group, it's nice to get to know each other, okay? So, uh, a little bit about myself, okay, as well. Okay, as you know, uh, they went to this. I'm actually from Department of Chemistry, Faculty Science. I've been here for almost, um, how many years? Huh? 16 already, okay? 
Um, and currently, my research is on uh, coordination compounds, uh, especially sheath bases. So I'm a synthetic inorganic chemist. Okay, we work with coordination chemistry. And I'm also venturing into MOF, as you're saying, a metal organic framework. I have a student now working on it, so it's almost a year now. Um, so that's my area, like, basically. And I, I was trained overseas, like, basically. That's why I can do the compare and comparison, usually. But, um, but I still feel that um, with, with even the lack of sometimes facilities and sometimes it's very difficult to get uh, chemicals, I think the research in uh, Malaysia are very, um, how do I say, very creative in terms of getting things done. All right? Uh, even with, you know, we can still do great research, uh, even with those, you know, lack of facilities sometimes. You know, you have to be very clever. You do a lot more collaborative effort. You contact your, you know, supervisor overseas, or you make contact with overseas uh, people and do collaboration. That's what it is anyway in terms of science. You have to do a lot of collaborative work. So, as a student here, so don't get, um, don't, uh, I mean, especially if you have been overseas and you see the facilities are better, don't always compare, you know. You come here and say, okay, what can you do? Right? How can I play the system? How can I work with the system? You are given this kind of system, and you know, uh, how do I work within the realm of that system? Okay. So next topic, uh, hopefully, what time is it now? I want to finish this at once, so I might go a little bit fast, as like a bullet train. So if you want to stop me anywhere, just let me know. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about purchasing, storage, and a little bit of inventory. Okay, you're going to do a lot of this, you know? I mean, you're going to be buying chemicals, buying glassware most probably. Probably not very big equipment because that is actually uh, the task of your supervisor. You can suggest to your supervisor, I want this particular instrument, but maybe either you get it or not, it's up. You know, it depends on the budget. So, <sighs> when you talk about safety, there's a lot of things that goes into safety. A lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of things that can go into safety, basically, the management, yeah, the management has to do something, you know, create the policy, create the guidelines, storage and instruments, okay, you buy chemicals, where do you store them, uh, labs, planning and design, so when you want to create a lab, how do you plan it so that it uh, fit the safety measures and safety guidelines, you're going to do a lot of purchasing as well, and you're going to be de dealing a lot with suppliers, um, and then any chemicals that you use, after it's used, you're going to have a lot of waste. You're going to be generating waste, definitely. So how do we dispose of it legally? Okay, and, uh, and then, of course, then you have the human factor. So that's why we're trying. This thing, you have no, I mean, the human factor is you. So basically, we're trying to ensure that this is not going to be a big issue. So this will require, this factor will require proper training. Okay? So... <sighs> Why we are concerned about safety, so there are some statistics, okay? If you look at the general uh, uh, location of accidents, um, especially for a university, you know, for any uh, institution, you find that most of the accident occurs in the laboratory, right? About more, about 37%. I'm so sorry that I do not have where I got the statistics, okay? This is not a good presentation. If you're going to do it for your PhD, there should be a reference at the bottom here. So I'm, I'm showing you a bad one, okay? But just, I forgot where I got this information, okay? I should have actually a, a reference to where this information I got. But generally, um, most accidents tend to happen in the laboratory because in the laboratory, you have so many hazards, a lot of it, yeah? And it's concentrated in one small area. Okay, the lab. So, you, I'm sure you, I don't know whether you've seen this poster before, and this is a very, I find it's a quite a funny little poster. So, health and safety in the workplace. You never know when you might need it, okay? So, once it's happened, you know, we try to avoid, uh, we, we're doing precautions so that things like this do not happen when accidents happen. So, basically, this picture shows that uh, if this tree, they know that was, you know, it's very old, they should have cut it at the beginning, because it creates a hazard, okay? Maybe this tree is already old, it's a report sedike, okay? Probably they should have already cut it down in the beginning, all right? So before this thing happened. So I'm repeating again what uh, I think, uh, I think because this PowerPoint was actually an extended PowerPoint, so we've gone through this. We already defined what is hazard and risk. 
Um, so chemical classification is quite important. So when you buy chemicals, they can be classified uh, in nine ways, whether they are explosive, gases, flammable liquid, even solids can be flammable as well, oxidizing substances, uh, toxic and infection substances, radioactive, corrosive, and anything else that is not being classified here goes under class number nine, yeah, miscellaneous. So they come in different classes, and they come with different danger symbols. So this is much... This is some of the old symbols that still people are being, is being used still, all right? Because it has much more further information because sometimes explosive, even especially have categories. So they have like one, two, and three. So we look at the first one. So when you have explosive, okay? Uh, so there are more like chemicals that are capable of producing an explosive or pyrotechnic effect with a lot of heat being released and gases under certain condition, okay? And it can be initiated by heat, heat, shock, friction. That's why some chemicals, you have to handle, handle them carefully. Not just, you know, um, make sure that they, you avoid being, uh, them being placed near a heat source. Even how you carry it, okay? Transporting this material can also be very dangerous as well, okay? You need suitable vehicles that has shock absorbers, you have to plan the route. Basically, if this chemical was coming from a factory, maybe they have already have to have a planned route. Okay, which route should we take that has less, you know, sh you know the roads are very good, uh, there's, there's no bumpy road because any shocks. And then how you package this material for delivery is also going to be very important as well. Okay? Um, and then you have gases. Okay? So this is what I mean. Yeah? By gases, you have different types of gases. Okay? You can have flammable gases can have non-flammable ones, such as your nitrogen. So this will come in tanks, okay? And then you have toxic gases, you have oxidizing gases, all come with different symbols, okay? So usually the gases, I mean, I'm sure you'll be working with some of them, all right? How you place them in the lab is very important. It has to be tied to a wall, okay, fixed to a wall, so that it doesn't fall, okay? Um, and you also have to learn how to use the pressure gauge at the top. Okay, that is something you have to learn. Maybe your technician will know, how, okay, this is how you actually handle it. There's a way of handling gases. And then you have flammable liquids, okay? So these are liquids that are capable of being ignited and burned, all right? Um, and you can also, uh, so there, there's different ways of packaging them. PG means packaging. Um, so, there's a, a, so you give them numbers, because some, some, some will have, a, if they have a flash point less than 23 degrees Celsius or between this temperature, um, anything that has, doesn't have a uh, flash point, we can consider degree of danger, high, medium, or low, okay? So you package them uh, based on the number. And then, of course, as I said to you before, solid can also be flavorable. Um, for example, the subclass one, which has things like metal powders or naphthalene, self-reactive and related substances which have strong azotomic reactions such as your azides and then our desensitized explosive, okay, such as your nitrocellulose with alcohol or ammonium picrate. So these are things that can explode, yeah? um, sorry, flame, it's flammable depending on which uh, uh, solid materials you're working with. And then you have subclass number two, which is liable to spontaneous com combustion. I'm not going to go into details. And then substances that are in contact with water emit flammable gases. So this one, things that you can actually go up and look it up. Okay, I'm just trying to show you different classification of um, materials. And then you have oxidizing substances. Okay, you have the one that are not necessarily combustible, but readily emit oxygen and gas, or contribute to the combustion of other materials, such as your hydrogen peroxide, copper chloride, and fluorine. Or you have things that we call organic peroxide as well. So as you can see, the oxidizing agent, they tend to have a symbol 5.1, and then they have 5.2 like that, okay? So you need to know, it's very important where, where you class your material. And then you have uh, toxic and infectious substances, I'm sorry about the, I just realized the diagram here is not right. It should have color. 
Um, uh, so anything with toxic will have the sign toxic, and anything with infectious, you've seen this sign before, can? It's used a lot in movies, can? A lot of where you have all these zombies, whatever. They tend to have these infectious substances, okay? If you see this, you already know it's scary, isn't it? If you see this symbol. So sometimes symbol give you a lot of uh, uh, stories behind those particular symbols they have. Uh, but this symbol is very, very famous because it shows infectious diseases. And then also uh, radioactive substances. And there are three categories. Um, so they're, they're, uh, category one, two, and three, depending on the value here, the SV value. Um, and then this actually follow the our Pansa Code of Practice for Safe Transport of Radioactive substances because we follow the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Agency's uh, code of uh, uh, packaging this kind of material. And then you have corrosive materials, and then I'm going to go a bit faster, and then anything with miscellaneous, anything that doesn't come under class number one until eight will go under miscellaneous dangerous goods. Okay. Okay, so, um, so basically, how chemicals have been classified, they have been following certain regulations. Uh, one is the European Customer Invention of Chemical Substances. Uh, the people have used this to classify their chemicals. Um, and then also, they have also been using this classification and labeling inventory, uh, which uh, under the CLP regulation and is registered under REACH. Um, so basically, they have used these two systems in order to classify the chemical uh, around the world. And then in Malaysia, basically, if you have um, hazardous substances, uh, it all, it all will, you always have to report it to the DOE, Department, uh, Department of Environment. So notification and registration of environmentally hazardous substances. So if you're actually working, UPM has to follow this act. Eh? It comes under an act. So that's why every year, um, the OSH office will ask uh, each of the uh, uh, faculty or institute to give them the list of chemicals so that they can report it to the, it has to be registered. All right, they have to put it into a system so that DOE we, uh, we follow the, the law, okay? It's, uh, so if we don't, um, then we, uh, UPM can be liable, all right? So, and all the materials that has hazardous uh, has to be registered, okay, with the DOE. Um, and usually we have a lot, the information that they require, usually the volume, how much you have, okay? And then, um, the, especially the volume, lah, basically, how much you have. That has to be reported to the... Uh, DOE. So, let's look at chemical management and how do you actually start buying, okay? Forgive me, I have to sit down. I have a very uh, bad knee, <laughs> that's a problem. Um, so, so, with chemical management, um, so this is the, the st from the, the time you start purchasing and then until towards inspection. So, basically, these are particular steps that you must take, okay? So, I know some of you have already been doing this, but I want you to, cl to clarify uh, certain stages. So, the first thing you do is purchasing, okay? Here at UPM, um, I'm not particularly sure because I haven't spoken to the ITMA how they actually do this, but at our faculty, this is basically it, and I think it's similar to all the uh, centers and faculties at UPM, okay? So when you want to buy the chemicals, of course, you need three quotations from three suppliers, three different suppliers that is needed, okay? Remember, please, if you do it wrongly, the bandahari will turn back the form and it will take ages. So do it correctly from the beginning, okay? So you need, uh, so usually the finding of quotation, your supervisor will leave it to you to go and find them, all right? So usually, um, if you're new to the... Uh, institute or faculty, usually uh, the uh, technician will know certain suppliers. They will, for, you can just get information about suppliers that have been coming to ITMA, and then from them, you can ask for quotation for this chemical. But you need three quotations. I don't know why, but that's the rules uh, when it comes to purchasing. 
You need three quotations for the chemicals that you want. And then you fill in a request order, RO. Nowadays, at UPM, we don't fill in now. Uh, it's a paperless one now. Uh, basically, you have to fill it on online using ERO. Okay? And then the ERO, the username and the password, is only given to your supervisor. Staff only will have that. Okay? So you, the students cannot actually fill it in. So uh, at the moment, I'm doing it for my students. Once they have actually got the, uh, the list of chemicals that they want, and then I'm the one who actually fill in. So it's a bit of a hassle because now we're doing clerical work, but that's at the rules and regulations. I do not know some supervisor, they're very kind. They give their username and password, but that username and password is used for everything. Your email, you know, if your student knows, the, your supervisor has to be really trustworthy lah, that you do not use it for anything else because it also gets into the SMP system, putting marks for undergraduates and everything. One username for everything. How dangerous is that, isn't it? Okay. So that's why I'm not allowing my students to have my username and password. So I do it myself. It's a bit of a hassle, but what to do? Okay. So now we do an ERO. So once you fill in the ERO, you print it out. You print the ERO. It's, although it's said paperless, but you still have to print it out and pass it to the person in charge, usually your head of department, to sign it off. All right. Once it has been signed, then the RO will be sent. In our case, our faculty will send it to the TDP office, whereby you have a clerk that will actually fill in uh, a monitor and then uh, send that RO to the bursar. Okay. Once the RO has been received by the bursar, they will issue what we call a PO, purchase order. And this purchase order must be given to the supplier. Only then the supplier can purchase it. So let me just give you a rough estimate how long this will take. Eh? Okay, obtaining the three quotation, if you're good with your suppliers, maybe a week. All right, you get your three quotation. Then fill in the request order. That should not take ages, lah. one hour. Fill it in, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then send it to your. Uh, for our case, head of department, yours probably pengarah it ma lah kot. Okay? He, he or she will sign it off, sign it to approve. Okay? So depending, kalau dia cuti hari itu, tak tahu lah. I don't know. So maybe give it two or three days for this. And then send it to the uh, main person, uh, probably it ma, uh, you just send it to it ma, then through way, they will log it in, and then send it to the bursar. This process maybe take another week. Okay, that's already two weeks, eh? just getting there. And then, the benda hari. Mm -mm -mm. The Bandari of UPM. Okay, this is recorded, isn't it? Okay, wait a minute. Should I say something nice or something? Hmm. Okay. Right. Say. Okay. I I should say something politically correct. <laughs> Depending on which person you get, some of some of the time it will be very quick. Sometimes it will take ages. So you have to ch you have to be the kind of person who chase the person. So give them maybe three days. Okay, after three days, just give them a, a nice, polite ring, peringatan mesra, okay? Just call, uh, did you receive my, this RO, blah, blah, blah? Uh, I think you have to call them, because if you don't call them, sometimes they forget, okay? Um, especially when you require the material very, very fast, okay? Because the most important thing is to get this PO out. I do not know why it takes so long, once they receive the RO, to get the PO out. Okay, I do not, not know, I cannot say anything about the inner working of Bursa. I can just say it's summertime, it takes ages. Okay, and um, sometimes our form get misplaced. Sometimes they say, oh, we didn't receive it. Although you have recorded, you have received. So I do not know. It's very magical, the Bursa world. You know, things goes missing, sometimes things just get lost. So that's why always get into the habit of photocopying your RO. You know, once you have actually made your RO, photocopy it, put it in your... But now it's great because once you fill in the ERO, it's already in the system. So basically that's a good thing as well because it's already in the system. It's recorded already in the system. So they cannot lie unless they have like a hacker. Delete, delete, delete. Okay? So no evidence. No, they don't do that. Lah, okay? I'm trying to be funny, but I guess. And then once the PO has come, this is sometimes the annoying thing for me. Lah. Once the PO has come, the bursar will not call the supplier. You know, the, the, the form, the PO will come back to you 
to it, they send it back, and then you, you yourself have to call, okay, the PO is ready, you have to come and get it. I do not understand why is it so hard for the person just, hello, your, your, you know, the name of the company is already on the purchase, or, the purchase order, kan? I don't understand why they cannot call it. It's, maybe it's very hard kot, just to pick up the phone, you know, like, it's too much time for them to call. Uh, it gets to me, I mean, I'm very really annoyed, kan? Because it, that, because it has to travel back to, back to the faculty. That will take, what, another day? Can you see how inefficient that is? Yeah, that will take another, or maybe two days, if you don't have a runner. Sometimes I ask my student even go to pick it up. Go and pick it up. Go and pick it up to the, go to the bursar office, just pick it up. Because it will take ages, alright? Because you have to give the PO to your supplier. So once the supplier get the PO, then they can order. That's their policy. There are suppliers who are trustworthy. You know, that they trust you that you're going to buy from them. You know, that you, when you already put in the request order, you know, okay, I've already put in the request order and you say you already have money in your bank, uh, you know, your research grant is enough and you'll say, oh, can, can you just order it now? You know, because for them to purchase order, because the chemicals are not coming from Malaysia, most a lot of the chemicals are from overseas. So they have to put in their purchase request order to the company. So can you imagine, that will take two or three weeks. Sometimes the delivery time that they will put in is four to six weeks, most of the time. In the purchase, once the purchase order comes out, the, they will say four to six weeks of delivery. You know, a month. It's already a month. So some, company, some companies, they, are, they have been working with UPM so many years, so they have established, they know, they know the problems that we face, and they say, okay, all right, have you, okay, they already, once we, at this stage, when we fill in the request order, they already start ordering from overseas. Uh, this is especially when you have suppliers who are very big. They are big companies, so they have the money, all right? So meaning that they can actually, they're trustworthy, they order it for you. So when the PO comes out, actually the chemicals is already there in Malaysia. So it's quick lah. So if you can get that kind of suppliers, it's fantastic. But if you don't get it, <laughs> this can take two to three months just to get your chemical. That's why if you're a researcher in Malaysia, you have to be very proactive, you have to, you have to plan ahead, you have to be looking forward to six months ahead, just in terms of ordering. So basically, that's why you have to monitor, to monitor your inventory of chemicals very closely. So basically, if your solvent left, okay, after two months, you check your solvent, only two bottles, straight away, I would straight away order it. Don't wait until it finished, because once it finished, that's it. You're going to wait another three months. So there's a not, there's, there will not be a constant supply. But there is now a move uh, by UPM to create a central store, but it's still under discussion, whereby they're going to create a central store where UPM is going to buy a lot of the common chemicals, common solvent in bulk, and they put it there. So if people want to, uh, if any researchers want to buy it, they can go to the central store for common chemicals, like especially solvents, like basically, or common common salts, they buy it in bulk. You know, so that you, we don't have to wait this the length this waiting of like for almost three months just to get your chemicals. It's actually silly, actually. And then once the chemical has arrived, the the chemicals will be arriving with, as with the delivery order. So it, there's R O P O N D O. Okay. So once the D O is uh, then you you check your chemicals. So basically, when you the chemical arrive, you have to check that the chemical arrives safely, uh, intact and must come with the safety data sheet. The supplier is obliged, it's not, it's compulsory for the supplier to provide the safety data sheet. They cannot send your chemicals without it. Okay? So if the chemicals comes without a safety data, you don't receive it, just say, I need the safety data sheet. Okay? It's not your responsibility to go and actually find it online. They have to, it's their responsibility for every chemicals that they uh, send must come with the safety data sheet. Okay, I think some students, they tend to, I always uh, check that, my students check that. Okay, so, so, okay, that's enough. So then you do, okay, that's why they say, upon receive, carefully review the safety data sheet um, and the label information regarding the health hazard, personal protective equipment that required for safe handling and any other pertinent information uh, associated with the use of that chemical. Um, and then you start classifying them. Lah. Um, you do, uh, it's a good idea to put the date of receive and if there's an expiry date, mention it as well on the bottom, remark it on the bottle, okay? And then also, it's also good as well, sometimes you don't use your chemicals immediately, 
all right? So you leave it for another one or two months. But once you open it, you also put the date that the bottle is open. Okay? Get into the habit, use a permanent marker, just write it on the label, on the bottle itself. So uh, people know, okay, this chemical habit. Not. Sometimes it's very problematic is when I have, we had this issue before when we were doing a spring cleaning of our lab. We have chemicals that are open. We don't know whether this is still good or not, isn't it? It looks old. We don't, want to re we don't want to dispose it because it's very expensive, but we just are unsure how long has this been open, how long has it been used. So um, it's, it's very difficult for, not for you, it's for the people come that after you when you're not there. You cannot ask them anymore, isn't it? You're not there. So get into the habit of writing the date of uh, chemicals. Uh, the date is open. Okay? And then chemical storage. <laughs> this is not a good way of storing your chemicals like that. It's fully fat. This is dangerous. Look at the aisle. It's fully full. Anything can happen. All right? So, so in generally, okay, uh, chemical storages and chemical waste have SOP that follows the government rules of OSHA 1994. Um, and the general way uh, of doing this is it has to be stored securely. This is important. Nowadays, people don't talk about chemical safety anymore. They talk about chemical security, all right? Because you have a lot of these cases over now in the world where people can easily get access to chemicals and mix bombs and things like that. Lah. So people are more concerned now, not about safety, about security. Where do you put your, uh, store your chemical? Is it, has it a very good security, I mean, is it secure enough, you know? Can anybody get access to it or only specific people can get access to it, which is, that's why it's very important, yeah? People talk about chemical security. Um, so any chemicals that has arrived in your lab, I'm sure there's a file in your lab, which is the inventory list, okay? So the inventory list, so get into the habit, once you have received your chemicals, straight away put it inside the inventory list. Don't wait until like, two or three months, and then baru nak letak. Because then you get into trouble, okay? You have all these chemicals, you don't know the date. So once you receive, take out the file, put it straight away into the inventory list. And then, um, okay? And then how do you store them? So you, that's why you need to know your classes of compound. Some compounds cannot be stored together. They're called incompatible, all right? So basically, in your safety data sheet, it will tell you, okay, this chemical cannot be stored with this chemical. So don't slap up, gata gata, pergi letak at the <laughs> two chemicals that are not in common next to each other. You cannot do that, all right? So um, I do not even memorize which are in common. I usually look at the safety data sheet, okay? There are some chemicals, they are, not, uh, they are incompatible, so meaning you cannot store them together. So those information is in the safety data sheet, right? Um, and then for liquids, especially solvents. Um, so usually solvents uh, comes in a Winchester bottle, all right? And then usually they are uh, five liter glass. There are some that comes in tin too. They, uh, they deliver in tin, square tins of 20 liters, all right? Some solvents are stopped because they are common solvents. They come in bulk, uh, in 20 liter solvents. And when, so what people do is when they receive here, they use old Winchester bottle to transfer because they can't, you know, to transfer about 20, you know, they, you can't use from the tank, eh? you have to transfer it to another Winchester bottle. So, uh, so there, there are ways of doing this, okay? Um, and then, usually cap, for liquids, the most important thing is actually a lot of it will have the sign flammable and combustible liquids. So where do you store them? So, um, the good, the... The best way of storing them is usually inside uh, steel cabinets. That's the best thing. Okay, if you have the money, you buy steel cabinets. All right, that's where you store all your flavorable solvents. Uh, but I know some that do not have that. They store it in just underneath the the bench. Okay, so you try as much as possible. If you if you the the place that you want to put your flavorable stuff is that not near a heat source. Um, not on the floor, if you have a steel cabinet, that's the best way because everything is inside the steel cabinet. If, there's a, if there was a fire, everything is contained in that steel cabinet, it still gives you time to actually run away. Although it will explode, whatever, but it will give you extra time, right? Especially, I know some labs are still using wooden um, 
benches. And I know, especially in my lab, <laughs> we still store them, some of them underneath. But we just don't have enough space. Those are the space that are given to us. So we just have to be extra careful with it. Okay? And then, um, how about storage for compressed gas? Okay? So most gas comes in uh, cylinder tanks. And then, uh, the problem with the cylinder tank, it can easily topple. It can easily fall down. So what you need to do is you have to very securely fix them to the wall. Alright? When, uh, when you store them. So if it's in the lab, you should have a, a chain. You know, a chain that actually locks the, the cylinder tank onto the wall. Jangan lah pula ketuk. And then when you fix it as well, it must be somewhere that is like to, uh, to a wall or your bench top that is very fixed to the floor so that it doesn't move. Okay? You, it can, because it can easily topple. Okay, again, I keep putting this because I want to show you that you have to keep your clap clean and tidy. So this is actually the way, an orderly way of um, storing your chemicals. This is a quite a good uh, um, a shelf because can you see the shelf here has a lip, slight lip, so that it doesn't straight, it's not, it's, it's not flush like this. It has a bit of a lip so that it doesn't fall down. Okay, so that's quite a good, um, if you have... Uh, a storage area and then when you also you have to be also mindful of using overhead area because this is when you are you come to a, a lab that has very limited space okay so you use all the space available what is she doing is she actually putting like a glassware that contains solvent this is particularly wrong lah. okay I wouldn't put something like this at the top Okay, you would you you if you're going to use the top bit, probably you put something that is light. Your uh, you know things that uh, can you know when it falls, it is not a solvent, it's not a liquid. Probably you put things that are solid on the top. You wouldn't put something with an open beaker like this. That is crazy. Huh? this is very very crazy. Okay, you don't. Although she's wearing all the proper PE, oh, she's happy. Yes, I'm doing this. No 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 no. You know, if I see my student doing this, I will say. Okay, let's try, just get a water, put it in the beaker, see what it falls. <laughs> Does it, can it easily fall or not? This is an open beaker, all right? Um, uh, even how f you feel that it's safe, luckily we are not in a country that is prone to earthquakes, okay? If this was somewhere in Indonesia, where it's in the lingkaran, apa ni, lingkaran apa, gempa bumi tu, can you imagine having things like this at the top? That's very, very dangerous, Okay? All right, so the do's and don'ts. Okay, let me sit down again. Um, so, how do you actually store your chemicals? Okay, you have so many, many chemicals in your lab. Do you arrange them alphabetically in the lab? You follow like A, B, C, D, E? Do you do that? Yes? Alphabetically, so meaning that you have a chemical acetone, and then the next one is uh, benzene. So you follow alphabet like that. Do you? No, eh? You follow their hazards, classification, chemical hazards, because each chemicals we come with a hazard. Initially, I was like you at the beginning when I, before I was introduced to safety. Of course, I'm more of an alphabet person. You know, you you order systematically lah. Senala nanti nak cari chemicals. A, you go to the A section. B, you go to the B section. No, you don't do that. That's very wrong. Eh? That's the wrong way to do it. You always uh, store your chemicals following their hazard. Okay. So if their hazard is toxic, you know, you put all the chemicals that are toxic together. Then inside the toxic classification, then you order them alphabetically. That's how you should do it. So you actually do this, yeah? store all chemicals following their hazard class. Must, yeah? So if in your lab you're still doing that, or at frame you're still doing that. Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Itu yang you buat sekarang ke? Kenapa? Tadi bila saya tanya, alphabet, you follow ke alphabet? No lah. The most important thing is how you do class, uh, storage. First, follow the classification hazard, then alphabetically. Okay? So if I was doing a audit on safety, that would have failed just now. Kalau you buat tadi follow alphabet from the beginning, without the following the chemical hazard, then I would have failed you. So you won't get the safety audit uh, fail. And then, um, so that's why I say, don't, eh? Store all chemicals in alphabetical order because some chemicals are not compatible next to each other. So it's very dangerous to do that, to store them together. 
some chemical fume cupboards have ventilated storage cabinet underneath. Okay, that's why if you look at fume cupboards in my lab, because we don't have uh, steel cabinets, uh, we tend to use the underneath of uh, the fume cupboards where we store our solvents because um, it's ventilated. So that is not because the problem with uh, storing solvents, although you're fully capped, you just worry that some of the solvents still evaporate slightly, okay? So if you have a very close environment that does not, uh, is not well ventilated, gas will be trapped in there. So if, you know, anything can happen, you know, if you're a spark or whatever. So that's why a lot of our, because we are limited of space in my lab, we tend to have put our solvents underneath the uh, fume cupboards, you know, because it's well ventilated. So that's where we place some, uh, we have, if we have extra. So we usually do not order much. Lah. We all tend to order just the right amount so that, because we have limited space. Okay. Um, and then, okay. So if you have chemicals that exhibit more than one hazard, I mean, it's toxic and, for example, if the uh, compound is toxic and flammable, okay. I would give it, uh, I, would class, I would actually put them, there's no such thing as a section on toxic and hazard. You don't do that, kan? Because when you uh, set up your lab, you already put uh, different areas for toxic, hazardous, uh, toxic material, flammable, corrosive. You don't have like corrosive slash toxic. It's going to be very complicated, all right? So what you do is that if one chemical have more than one chemical hazard, you use the one which is the highest, okay? If you have like toxic and flammable, which one is probably highest? It will be flammable because flammable is easier to happen because toxic is when you consume or it touches your skin. But flammable, it can easily be flammable if it has a heat source, you know, if it, if it vaporizes. So you put it under the highest hazard which is flammable. So that's important if a chemical show then one more hazard, yeah? classification of hazard. And then, of course, you buy chemicals in appropriate amount. That's why you need to check first. One of the things that I hate my students doing is that they never checked how much chemicals we already have. Because what they, that's the issue when you do not fill in your inventory properly. Sometimes they order the same, I, even I know, as a supervisor, sometimes I also forget. Okay, I'm hoping that my students will check the inventory. So that's my fault as well. Uh, and then they order the same chemicals. And then um, after when we do our spring cleaning, we say, like, oh my God, why do we have four bottles of sodium chloride? You know, like, why do we need four bottles? Then they do realize, oh, doctor, I just found this in the lab. So which means that they didn't do a proper check before they order. Or they didn't check the inventory list to see that they will already have sodium chloride. Okay, that's why it's very, uh, it's very important to have proper uh, inventory list of all your chemicals and the amount. So usually when you have used your materials, you always put out, okay, uh, leftover, another 100 gram or something like that in the inventory list. So that you always keep track of the amount that is available in the lab. Okay, a good lab will always have a good inventory system. Okay, so uh, this is another thing that UPM is also embarking as well uh, because for, for a long time we have doing this manually and I think it was a bit crazy to do it manually because it's much easier to do it online, have an online database. So basically when you get your chemical, these days there's, most chemicals will come, will come with a barcode, betul tak? Kan dia ada barcode kat situ. I know some universities, they just, you just scan the barcode. Scan the barcode, it goes into the system. So much easy. All right? Uh, UPM is probably going there now. They're developing the, soft, uh, the database for that. Um, I did ask, when is it going to be available? They're still working on it. It's still not yet available. But I think once it's available and up, what we have to do is actually put everything. You have to, your lab have to do an online, of like what we call it, one day, just putting everything online into the database. Okay, so uh, it's still not um, up and running yet, um, but I, th I think it's high time. Overseas university, they already have, you know, you know. We could buy the system. There's actually a system, inventory, chemical database inventory system that is already, but it's expensive. So that's why UPM is developing its own uh, inventory database system. 
Um, and then, any chemicals that require refrigeration, of course, you have to use the fridge, lah, basically. Okay? Some chemicals need to be stored under, uh, below 5 degrees Celsius. That's why you need the fridge. Okay? And the fridge is a fridge for chemicals, not fridge for food. Alright? I know some students use it, oh, tak apa, doctor. Uh, we're doing a celebration. We don't have a place to put our cake. Alright? So they were having a party. Okay? They bought a cake from Secret Recipe. And they said, oh, where should we put it in the meantime? Okay, put it in the fridge lah, with all the other chemicals. Uh, that's wrong lah, eh? Okay? Um, uh, not that my student has done it, but I just feel that some students might think that it's appropriate, yeah? You don't mix food with chemicals. Okay, as I said to you before, the chemicals should be classified into different class, which is flammable, oxidizer, corrosive, reactive, toxin, and compressed, uh, if a compressed gas cylinder. Okay? Uh, this is another thing, inventory. As I said to you before as well, once you receive your chemicals, you have to put it into the inventory, meaning those, the things that... Um, UPM has its own inventory sheet uh, following the ISO. I'm sure at your lab, if you open your file, there's an inventory list. Okay? Uh, and on those, you should have date of receive, expiry date, where you, look, where you put your chemicals. So in your lab, basically, you should have labels for... Um, Shelf number one, shelf number two, shelf number three, cupboard number one, cupboard number two. So that when somebody comes into the lab, okay, I want sodium chloride. They open the inventory file, they look at sodium chloride, they see the amount that is held. Oh, there's still a lot. Where is it stored? Cupboard number one. So that's where you should put it. So you have to have location as well. But I, believe, I can tell you that this doesn't happen as well. Sometimes students, uh, when they use it, they tend to put it somewhere else. Lepas tu it's a treasure hunt. Okay, you have a treasure hunt in the lab. Where is that? So I know there was sodium chloride, but I just cannot find it. You know, like, so you start, you know, doing a treasure hunt in the lab, you know, okay, whoever find it, win 1,000 ringgit, whatever lah. Okay, that's the thing. So, where you get them, put it back. And then, you should have a file where you put all your safety data sheet for the chemicals. And then, um, amount of usage. Okay, so you're in the inventory list, there's also every time, okay, I know, it was very hard, that, um, like maybe you use like one gram of that particular material. Takkan lah, like eventually like use one gram every time. So I know some people, they, you know, they will check like after maybe a few weeks, they tabulate, oh, think of 50 grams saja. So they, when it's a large amount, so that they keep track of the amount of it's left in that bottle. Okay, it's very important as well. This will help you in terms of purchases uh, for the next one. So these are some examples of inventory sheets. I uh, just want to go on. I'm, I'm sure when you go into the lab, have a go, have a look at the file and what it looks like and the information that is required from you to put inside the inventory list. Okay, it's very old. These are examples from other universities. Look, it's very nice, all very done. This is another example of inventory online. This is what I mean. Other universities already have this. I love this because it makes life so much easier. They can just read, they just use a barcode reader. So when the chemical arrives, toot, all the information goes into the inventory list. But the problem with the inventory, this is you have to buy. Lah. You know, when somebody has already created a database, um, you know, a system, you have to buy the system. And usually quite, it can be quite expensive. So hopefully the UPM one, once it's up and running, is as fantastic as this as well. I have a feeling it doesn't read barcode. I, I wish they did read the barcode, which is much easier rather than just uh, typing one by one, isn't it? Like, I can see the amount of work that is needed once it's up. Because my lab already have like more than 100, 200, maybe 500 chemicals. How long will that take to input into the system? It'll be like ages. Okay. And yeah, it'll take ages. <laughs> okay, so this is an example where you have online system from other university, which is fantastic. Alright, it's fine that you have ordered your chemicals. Okay, you started doing your experiment. Um, so everything is doing, uh, everything is hunky-dory, you, you know, you have, you have purchased your chemical, it has arrived, you've been using it, you're storing it in the right place, following the, chem, uh, the hazard class. But then you have to do um, what we call inspection. It's very important to do inspection, at least once a year, okay? Or maybe twice a year, that would be better, all right? What you do is you just, one day, uh, if you're lab, you should have always a gotong royong every semester. Um, I, uh, we do that in my particular lab. We always have it once every two semesters. Uh, so we do it twice a year. So that we go through, again, okay, we just checked. 
you know, as the uh, uh, other, because you never know. When you do your experiment, you tend to misplace your chemicals. So what we do is we clear it, make sure all the chemicals are in the right place. As also look at the bottles. Are they probably? Are they? You know, can you still see the labels? Okay. The most important, can you still see the labels? So if you feel that your labels has deteriorated, then you have to replace the label. This is especially when you handle your chemicals. Once you do not know uh, what your chemical is, there's label, you cannot read, there's going to be a problem. How do, I, do you identify that particular chemical? And it becomes a problem when you want to do waste disposal. Okay? It's going to be very expensive. Okay? So, you know that when we do our waste disposal, we're asking companies from outside to take our chemical waste. Okay, uh, in our case, it's from Quality Alarm. Okay, they have a, this company comes in, and then, but if they cannot identify the chemicals, okay, they will charge you more, because they do not know whether these chemicals can be put with the, uh, is it a halogenated compound? Is it a non-halogenated compound? Is it a combustible compound? Or is it incom incom incompatible with other stuff? Okay. Um, so it's, it's very, uh, it's quite, it can be a problem, okay? I've heard stories whereby, I do not want to name a place or time, I heard these particular stories, uh, before the time of uh, where we uh, hire uh, a company from outside, uh, we tend to dig up land, okay? Uh, and we put our chemicals in drums and then we just store it underneath the ground, okay? This was before we had the companies because it's expensive, can? So, uh, so this particular story is when they did it, this is a true story. So when they, did, when, they this, when they did this thing, because they did not know the chemicals, the different classification, so they were throwing the, no, the, the, the worst part was that it was throwing the, the doer, <laughs> the, the waste, and it hit something and suddenly it exploded, you know, it exploded and um, so these people were started to run and it was like cloud, black smoke, uh, so the fire engine had to come in. So, uh, so that shows you that somebody has not, when they do, when they, um, what do you call it? When they were disposing of their waste, they did not classify it correctly. Okay, they didn't put it in the right bottle. Right? So this is a true story, I should not name please and whoever did this, you know, uh, it's a secret. Okay. Um, and then, so, if there's any sign of deterioration or integrity of the label, you should probably uh, report this, or if you can um, replace the label with your own label, then that's even better, okay? So, can you see, this is a beautiful, this is a kind of cupboard that, I, that is quite nice, because it's one of the things about this particular cupboard, it has a door, so meaning that it cannot topple over, and then you can also lock it for security, uh, this is one of the things, chemical security. So basically, some of this has lock, and you can actually lock it as well. So nobody can actually get enter and just pick up a bottle and take it away. All right? And also, if there's an earthquake or whatever, all the chemicals will be shaking inside the, the cupboard. Right? Uh, so this is what I mean by distilled cabinet. Okay? Distilled cabinet here is for mostly for solvents, and usually have this... Um, and what we do is that... Uh, I, I, I don't know whether they have this, but usually at the front of the cabinet, you put, you put a list of all the chemicals that is inside that cabinet. All right? That's what you should do, yeah? Um, the, the, because it's a closed cabinet, you cannot see what is inside, so you should have a list outside the cabinet. So you put uh, whether you have how many bottles of acetone, how many bottles of toluene or whatever, should be outside the lab. Uh, so should be outside and stick on the steel uh, Cabinet, cabinet here. Sorry. So this is the fridge. So is usually have proper fridge. So again, same with the steel cabinet. You should have information of what is inside the fridge. Okay, um, because it's very important. Sometimes you do not want to open the fridge. 
if you don't know what is inside, especially when you have a fire or things like that, because if you open it, maybe it will actually um, ag aggravate the, the fire. So you probably don't put anything. Uh, that's why a list is also important outside. Um, and then, okay. So this is a beautiful, I, can, I love when it's very systematic and it's all nicely uh, you know, arranged. As you can see, all the chemicals are properly arranged. So if you have many people sharing the fridge, okay, if you're working in a, in, a, in a lab with more than like, it's just not you, you have a lot of people, it will be advisable to buy what we call containers with your names. So basically, all the, your own chemical will be in that container. So something like this. Lah. Can you see those containers? It belongs to specific students. So you don't have a mix. All right? So I would advise you to buy proper containers, just plastic containers. Just put them in there. So it's easily um, identified, especially when you make your own compounds, synthetic compounds. Okay? If it's a shared uh, chemicals, then it's okay to put it outside where everybody can see. But if it's your own and you don't want people to use it, and it's your own compound, nobody should touch it, then use proper container. And I would advise using the same size container that fits everyone and proper labeling of the container. It's all about labels, you know? Have good labels and everything is okay. If you're an IKEA person, it's fantastic. Yeah? Yeah, Swedish people are very good at uh, arranging yeah, stuff. And of course, oh my God, it's more than one o'clock. Yeah? <gasps> okay, no wonder I'm taking so long. Okay. I can hear the azan. Okay, then you can see here, waste bottles, all right? Remember your waste, um, you have to put them in specific bottles. So the bottles will be labelled. You use your old Winchester bottle from your own solvent that you have used, and then you label them. And then uh, say, this is a waste bottle for non-halogenated. This is probably the waste bottle for halogenated. So, it's, uh, so you can do that. And then these are bio... Especially if you're working with biohazard materials, there's a special plastic bag that has this biohazard sign. So people know that it's, that's, it's not normal rubbish. Okay, it contains hazardous material. Some comes with a proper, um, uh, okay, that's it, okay? Some come with a proper lid and then you can actually put the, the stuff in, okay? So any questions? Actually, I've exceeded my time um, and I haven't actually gone on to waste, actually. So, but I think, uh, for waste uh, disposal, uh, briefly, I can just maybe explain without showing the slides. Uh, it's very simple. I can just leave the slide here. Um, so when it comes to the waste, um, so in your labs, you're going to have proper uh, different bottles for different waste. Okay? So when you actually um, do your reactions, and then you have to know what kind of waste you're producing. And then every time, you must put it in the right bottle. Okay, so once it gets to the particular limit, I don't know how, how they do it in ITMA, um, so you have to actually uh, contact the person in charge. So at ITMA, there will be one person in charge, I don't know, the science officer that is in charge of handling chemical waste. So there will be, so once your, your bottle is almost full, okay, that means that you need to take it away from the lab. It should not be stored ready there. So ITMA will have a storage area for chemical waste. So you have to send it there. So I think that one, you have to speak to your uh, science officer at ITMA. When is the day for collections? They usually have days when they collect chemical waste. Okay, a specific day or maybe they do it once a month. I do not know. And that's when they store it. Uh, so we have a store. So once the store is full, then we call the company from outside, which is Quality Alarm. Uh, at our faculty, we use Quality Alarm here, ITMA. Quality Alarm juga? Oh, you did forget OSH UPM, so we directly call. <laughs> um, because we are a big faculty, we have a lot, so we usually deal directly because the money comes from us. Lah. <laughs> so we have to actually... So it's very expensive to... Every time they come, it's about more than... 30,000, something like that, you know, just to get rid of our chemical waste. So usually, we call them at least once a year, at least once a year. Lah. So, so we, uh, at UPM, we have, at of our faculty, we have this, uh, this big storeroom that we put our chemical waste in there. Okay? So, so you, what you do is, in your lab, once you have done with your chemical, you put it in your specific chemical so, uh, waste bottle. So you should know the chemical waste bottle in your lab. And then once you put it in, once it's almost full, you contact your science officer or whoever is in charge at ITMA that handle chemical waste. They'll put it in the store. There's a temporary store. And that once that temporary store is almost full, 
then that's when you call the proper agency uh, to take away your chemical. And it's not cheap. Yeah? So that's why when you do your synthetic experiment, think about the amount of solvent that you're using. Is it needed that you use one liter? Could, have, could you have done your syn uh, synthesis with, what, 500 milliliter? So always think about your experiment. So don't waste. Because remember, the more waste you do, the more expensive for us to get rid of it. Okay? And never, ever throw your waste down the sink. That's a big no-no. Okay? Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was like you. I was a bit um, reckless. Um, I remember I was a bit lazy. I was, I was doing my experiment, and I thought I could get away. I threw... It was just a normal... It was ether. It was like acetone, for example. Even acetone is not... Uh, you cannot throw it down the drain. So after I did my experiment, I, threw, I just washed all my stuff and I put it down the drain. And then I got a wig. Okay, and somebody from downstairs, the lab downstairs came up and they say, did you just, did you just throw, you know, uh, wash something, acetone down the, the drain? Uh, I was like, mm, okay, being a foreign student, you know, like suddenly like got a bit scared. <laughs> I said, um, yes, that's a no-no. So I got reprimanded by it lah, because... I, because they can smell it, it's strong, it's down the sink, yeah, they said you cannot do it, so I got reprimanded by it. So basically, you should never do that, all right? So always put it in the correct waste bottle that has already been labelled, and then, so that's the process, okay? Once it's almost full, you contact your science officer, the science officer will actually tell you where to put it in the store, and you should always have, uh, and then a company from outside will take the chemical waste. So in, in the best way is actually to, Really know about your experiment, how much salt, chemicals that you actually need. If you can scale it down, that's even bit better. If it, by scaling it down and you still get the same result, why do you have to do it at scale up? Okay? So always think about, you know, I think the most important thing is you always have to think about your synthesis, what you're doing, what you're making, how much you actually need. All right. So, and especially if you're also doing very dangerous first-time experiment, you should sit down with your um, supervisor, talk about the synthesis, and then do what we call a risk assessment on that ex experiment. What are the risks that you're taking? What, that's why certain, um, certain experiment that is very, very dangerous, I mean, we, we are here at UPM, we have not had that. Uh, when I was overseas, if you're doing an experiment, you have to do your risk assessment first and then get a signature from the safety committee saying that they allow you to do the experiment. Without that signature, approval from the safety committee, you cannot actually do the experiment. We have not yet come to that stage here at UPM where you have to do the risk assessment first. Okay, where you, you buy, you say, okay, especially for new, danger, new experiments that have not been done before or chemical uh, experiments that are using um, very um, uh, high-risk material, high-risk solvent, high-risk compounds, then you have, to go, you have to do your risk assessment. That's very, very important uh, before you do your experiments. So I think I have covered most of them. Um, so I hope it has been... Good uh, that you all. I mean, if you don't get like 100%, at least you get at, at least just be aware of the safety guidelines, safety feature in your lab. So, I think when you go back this afternoon or later on tomorrow when you get access to your lab again, first thing you do, what you do? What should you do when you enter the lab again? What should you do? Yes, observe the layout of the, the lab, find where are the safety features first. Get Put it in your mind. Then you start your work. Okay? All right, with that, thank you very much. I uh, uh, hope you continue on with the safety and, you, and by the end of this, you get your access card. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Muhammad Ibrahim for the useful information and for the sharing for today. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a lunch break, so please, uh, we continue at 2.30 p.m. All right, thank you.